This work is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial 4.0 International License. Staring into the Void The Resolution of Nihilism Through Buddhist Practice by Keller Dellinger Introduction Thrown into Emptiness Therefore, Ananda, you should train yourselves. We will enter and remain in the emptiness that is pure, superior, and unsurpassed. That is what the Blessed One said. Gratified, Venerable Ananda delighted in the Blessed One's words. Majjhima Nikaya 121 The purpose of this book is to save the earnest spiritual seeker some quantity of her most precious resource, time. Only a rare person will ask foundational questions. Answers to such questions are rarer still. Indeed, it is almost impossible to find answers that stand up to intense scrutiny. Wading one's way through the mire of religion and philosophy can be such an effort and so time-intensive that setting up shop, getting comfortable, and simply making a career out of it is a perennial temptation. The professional philosophers and theologians embedded in these sanctified arenas for posing such questions have been ruminating in their ivory towers for so long that coming to a final resolution of the search is implicitly branded as naive. The truth-seeking efforts of the serious contemplative are further stymied by the fact that all mainstream social structures are filled with myriad incentives and means for not questioning. Indeed, one could say that society's very purpose is to protect its members from the existential bewilderment, anxiety, and dread that comes from asking deep questions. This is, of course, very understandable. Ultimately, however, such protection is misguided. I wish for this book to give direction and relief to those who, in asking questions and finding no answers, may have despaired of ever coming to the end of their search. It is very easy to trudge along, bury one's mind in entertainment and projects, and envy those around you who don't seem to recognize just how futile it all seems. ignore holds some measure of comfort, no doubt. This long, lonely, and frigid stretch of the epistemic rabbit hole only seems to get worse the further you travel down it. These realities encourage resignation. They encourage giving up and getting comfortable. I write this book to offer warmth and reassurance to skeptics and seekers, to emphatically discourage submersion back into distraction and sublimation, back into that realm of unreflective bad faith heedless apathy, or ecstatic unconsciousness that is the death of nobility and authentic spirituality. The depth and pervasiveness of such generalized resignation is perhaps the most unique and defining aspect of the contemporary secular condition. It is not even controversial to state that life in a world dominated by science and capital is ultimately hopeless. The very form of such a world precludes any hope beyond the possibility of indefinitely sustaining one's material comfort. One may invest an identity into and make an intentional effort to produce such a hope, whether it is through political and cultural engagement or greasing the wheels of capital via scientific and entrepreneurial pursuits. And there is also, of course, always the possibility of remaining oblivious to the situation, contentedly consuming 
and thereby being consumed. Without a higher hope, whether our lives of desperation are quiet or loud, ultimately makes no difference. Higher hopes, of course, still abound in the world's extant religious traditions. It is a common intuition that religious faith, if nothing else, is at least valuable in so far as it grounds the individual believer in a strong ethical foundation and provides meaning to life amidst such hopelessness. Yet, to put it glibly, if the religions of the past were strong enough to protect us from the encroachment of an increasingly blatant cultural nihilism, to say nothing of nihilism's deeper and more pernicious varieties, we wouldn't be in the position in which we now find ourselves. The intellectual currents that set the Enlightenment in motion and eventually led to the contemporary academic Ouroboros of deconstruction were likely inevitable. Besides, regardless of their inevitability or otherwise, they happened and cannot be undone. We now have too much historical self-awareness and too much cosmopolitan mobility to ever truly bring God back from the dead. Even something as simple as the intensive study of ancient civilizations, let alone coexisting ones, is enough to mortally wound him. The recognition that there are people who held or hold radically different beliefs but are, nonetheless, people, and not simply the barbarian other, is all that it takes to plant the seed of nihilism. Once faith is revealed to be a simple and fragile choice, as opposed to something so ubiquitous, all-encompassing, and presupposed that it could be likened to water or oxygen, the first step into the void has already been taken. No, nihilism is not a problem that faith can ever solve. Although it is associated with crises of faith, political and social malaise, depression, and Kafka-esque bewilderment, nihilism is a much deeper, more primordial problem than any of these. Despite this, a standard definition for the phenomenon has remained elusive in the literature on nihilism. As Karen Carr explains... The diverse efforts to analyze and understand nihilism have remained largely isolated from one another. There is no real tradition of literature on nihilism, nor is there unanimity about how nihilism should be defined. In that same work, Carr delineates a taxonomy of nihilism, which is standard in the literature that takes nihilism as its sole topic, including such sub-varieties as epistemological nihilism, ontological nihilism, existential nihilism, and ethical nihilism. There appears to be consensus regarding the specific character of each one of the sub-varieties, so it would seem that the more general definition of nihilism proper remains the sole ambiguity. This ambiguity is not accidental, nor is it contrived. Keeping nihilism ambiguous, chopping it up into different pieces and sublimating those pieces into arcane discussions of the works of obscurantist philosophers or into reactionary cultural warfare blaming those same philosophers for the corruption of our society, keeps the problem at arm's length. As previously suggested, any attempt to truly address nihilism will never be permitted to enter the wider public consciousness. There is a reason why heretics have always been treated with such swift and violent reprisal, our social immune system is most sensitive to such infections. But enough of all that. Let's get down with the sickness and have our definition. Nihilism. The desire for intellectual security, juxtaposed 
with the manifest impossibility of ever attaining such security. This definition naturally demands further analysis, and this book will be partially, if not primarily, dedicated to satisfying this demand. It seems appropriate, though, to first begin with some more general remarks. It is widely acknowledged that nihilism is not a specific, formal ideology like most other isms. Such an understanding is preserved in our definition. Rather, nihilism is the negative of belief. Note that it is not the opposite of belief, but its consubstantial companion. One might categorize it as a spiritual aesthetic rather than a philosophy, for the philosopher, in the nihilistic mood, may hold his precious philosophies before letting them all drop to the floor like marbles. The perpetual possibility for the instantaneous devaluation of all that we hold sacred is the essence of nihilism. In this work, I will be describing and encouraging nothing less than a complete and final reckoning with this terrifying and liberating possibility. Such a reckoning will be complete insofar as it provides a resolution to the problem of nihilism. Following our definition, it would seem such a resolution must take one of two forms. Either we must eliminate our desire for intellectual security, or we must find a way to actually fulfill it. From this book's subtitle, it should be an obvious inference for anyone with even a passing knowledge of Buddhism that I will be advocating for the former solution. I freely admit, however, that such advocacy will be evangelical in nature, and not trivially so. The platitude of just let go, in all its insufferable inadequacy, will not be repeated here. It is standard Buddhist wisdom that problems can only be solved through understanding. Here, such understanding will involve penetrating into, among other things, the fundamental nature of belief, meaning, security, and futility. In order to affect such penetration, in order to attain even a fundamental understanding of the problem of nihilism, it is my contention that a thorough familiarity of the phenomenological and existential wisdom contained in the earliest Buddhist scriptures is of the highest importance. Moreover, undertaking the ascetic and contemplative training described and advocated by the Buddha is not merely crucial to resolving nihilism as a fundamental human problem. It is a requirement. I understand that this may seem far-fetched to some readers. Doubting that some Indian ascetic from 2,600 years ago could ever have something meaningful to say about such an abstract, anti-religious, and culturally disparate topic as existential nihilism is reasonable. But like much that seems reasonable, it is also wholly mistaken. To very quickly demonstrate as much, to give just a hint at how anticipated philosophers like Kierkegaard, Heidegger, and Sartre were by the Buddha, let us simply compare two brief quotations. One from Sartre's existential magnum opus, being and nothingness, and the other from the Samyutta Nikaya, an early Buddhist collection of scriptures. Consciousness does not have by itself any sufficiency of being as an absolute subjectivity. From the start, it refers to the thing. Just as two sheaves of reeds might stand leaning against each other, so too, with name and form as condition, Consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as condition, name and form comes to be. This reality, the fact that there is no such thing as pure consciousness, 
and that consciousness cannot exist without its object and vice versa has been recognized completely independently in two radically different cultures and languages separated by a gap of 2,500 years and the distance of an entire continent. Taken together with all the other incredible similarities between the insights contained in both the Buddhist discourses and the writings of the great phenomenologists, the close relationship of penetrating, corroborating discernment shared between the two is remarkable, to say the least. As I said before, my evangelism is not trivial. Accordingly, it will not take the common evangelical shape of attempting to simply modify your sense of identity and worldview. From my experiences with Buddhism as an institutional, historical, geographical, and sociological phenomenon, I can confidently say that for the vast majority of Buddhists, Buddhism is simply a religion like any other unreflectively adopting and submerging yourself into the doctrines, devotional rituals, and meditative techniques of your preferred Buddhist sect will not resolve the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. Resolving such questions requires going quite a bit deeper. Fortunately, the Buddha's teaching does indeed contain such depth, yet here we must do some disambiguation. What exactly do I mean by the Buddha's teaching? One could accurately describe the entire history of Buddhism as an attempt to answer that very question. When we talk about such a history, we are referring to a time period of 2,600 years and an area spanning from Greece to Japan, and now the entire planet. Branching modifications in doctrine, presentation, and technique over such a quantity of developmental space-time have led to a contemporary landscape filled with wildly divergent answers. Bringing the Buddha to bear on the problem of nihilism already represents something of a difficult bridge between East and West while an exposition of the entirety of post-schismatic Buddhism, detailing all the masks the Buddha wears around the world, is obviously far outside the purview of this book. After investigating many such masks for myself, however, it was actually the oldest one that seemed to speak most directly to the burning problems of contemporary life. Through critical, historical, and textual analysis, the academic field of early Buddhist studies has convincingly triangulated what scriptures amongst the gigantic Buddhist corpus are most closely linked to the oldest oral tradition, which ostensibly began with the personal disciples of the Buddha. While such teachings are preserved in multiple different recensions in multiple languages, which is one major reason why they are considered early, the most fully translated of these and the corpus with which I am most familiar are the early scriptures preserved in the Pali Canon. As such, I will hereafter be referring to the teachings of the Buddha as the Tamma. This is a Pali word equivalent to the Sanskrit word tarma, with such diverse meanings as teaching, way of life, truth with a capital T, and phenomenon. Insiduating ourselves squarely and exclusively within the early canon, we avoid two trends in later Buddhist development that are, to some extent, rather counterproductive to the existential interpretation and implementation of the tamma that will characterize this book. These two trends are, in historical order, the development of Buddhist scholasticism, exemplified by the systematic, comprehensive, and highly analytic interpretation of the tamma known as the abhitamma, followed later by the textual, cultural, geographical and metaphysical proliferation represented by Mahayana Buddhism. 
We may summarize setting aside later developments by stating that both trends, in their own way, diluted the sense of down-to-earth immediacy, existential renunciate urgency, and straightforward pedagogy that can be discerned in many of the early texts. Of course, it is still necessary to justify the choice to retain fidelity to an ostensibly arbitrary pseudo-historical figure. It has already been briefly indicated that the Buddha was, in his own context, a discerning phenomenologist, that is, a philosopher concerned with phenomena as they are directly apprehended in experience. To label him with an even more specific anachronism, he was an existential phenomenologist. The Buddha was deeply concerned with the nature of human existence as it is directly experienced and the dynamic relationship that nature maintains with our attitudes, choices, and notions of identity. Through the understanding he developed, the Buddha went from descriptive analysis into the prescriptive domain, expounding a very specific and detailed regimen of action, contemplation, and non-action for solving not merely specific spiritual or philosophical problems, but solving problem itself. Thus, in categorizing the Buddha as an existentialist, we here have linked the Tamma to our unifying project of successfully reckoning with nihilism, because it is in existential philosophy that such a reckoning has been previously attempted. Of course, one could perhaps even go so far as to characterize the entirety of 20th century philosophy as just such a reckoning. Heidegger approaching nihilism from the bottom up, and Wittgenstein from the top down, so to speak. It goes without saying that they were all unsuccessful, but this raises a question. If I'm so convinced that the Tama holds the key to unraveling nihilism, why even bother discussing these pesky philosophers at all? We may answer such a question in one word. Thoroneness. Lev Shestov described the Western intellectual tradition as a marriage between the reason of Athens and the faith of Jerusalem. In an unprecedented but hitherto relatively unacknowledged event, Martin Heidegger's development of this one-word concept, thrownness, inadvertently forged a new link, one between the tradition of Athens and the tradition of Savoirti. For it is in thrownness that the metaphysical and ethical angst of the existentialists meet the renunciate insight of the Buddha. Throneness, Geworfenheit in German, indicates the arbitrary, unownable, inescapable thusness of human existence. That your experience of reading this sentence is the way that it is, that it came to be this way in a manner totally outside of your comprehension or control, and that you are nonetheless thrown into that experience, whether you like it or not, this is thrownness. Thrownness may have been a relatively new idea for the West in 1927, but grappling with thrownness has been a part of Eastern spirituality and philosophy from the very beginning. In a moving testament to the timelessness of our human plight, we find an Indian sage lamenting in the Rig Veda, the oldest of the Vedas and amongst the most ancient pieces of literature in the world, What thing I truly am, I know not clearly. Bewildered and bound with a mind, I wander. Some readers may have felt pangs of the uncanny as thrownness was forced upon them in real time at the end of the last paragraph. This Vedic quote is an authentic expression of that very same emotion, 
expanded out to a cosmological level. Thrownness is the silence that our pleas for a secure, sensible world falls into unheard. Thrownness is the condition for our apprehension of values and for their slipping out of our fingers. Thrownness is that mist out of which our world and our lives are made. Thrownness is the pleasures we consume turning to dust in our mouths. Thrownness is what we put up walls to keep out. Thrownness is the core of layer upon layer of distraction. Thrownness is the impossibility of control. Thrownness is what God allowed us to forget. Thrownness is birth and death. Thrownness is the primordial horror of being. The full, unbridled, unprepared apprehension of thrownness is the stuff nightmares are made of. Did Heidegger truly comprehend all of what I just described? Did he really understand what he was getting himself into? From his naturally unfolding discussions of such topics as angst, the conscience, and death, it would seem that intuitively, in some limited way, he did. But did he reflect upon publishing Being and Time as Robert Oppenheimer did upon developing the atomic bomb? Of course not. Why would he? Relatively few people would ever read his philosophical tome and far fewer would understand it. Moreover, even if they did read and understand, because of their indulgent lifestyle and unquestioned, culturally conditioned attitudes regarding the nature of happiness, the Western philosophical community would not, as Heidegger did not, connect the nature of thrownness with a far more important topic, namely, the nature of suffering. This relative obscurity at least prevented Heidegger from suffering that further indignity placed upon the legacy of the Buddha, the indignity of being made into a god, an inhuman, inscrutable metaphysical principle placed on a pedestal out of reach, exhortations of the dangers of social entanglement and sensuality falling on mostly deaf ears before eventually being almost entirely discarded. It should not come as controversial to anyone familiar with the movement to say that, despite its shortcomings, and though many of its most important contributors were atheists, existentialism is the most deeply spiritual of all the philosophical schools. Yet, can it even accurately be called a discipline? After Sartre, it seems, the whole movement simply dried up. I suppose there was just nothing else left to say. Of course, existentialism continues to exert a huge influence on the arts and Western culture as a whole. But all that angst, inner turmoil, and struggle never really seems to have gone anywhere. It remains unresolved. Spiritually speaking, our culture has hit a wall, and this is no accident. It is in our fear of thrownness, in our putting up barriers to avoid it, that we do not recognize the radical ramifications such a recognition should have on our lives. Even without such barriers, seeing the extent of those ramifications is supremely difficult. On the face of it, Sartre was correct to assert that we are completely free, completely responsible for our lives and our beliefs, and are simply doomed to live in agony of that reality or ignore it via living in bad faith. Man is a useless passion. End of story. What else could there be? This is, of course, where the Buddha comes in.
in putting the Buddha in conversation with existentialism, we will accomplish two aims. Firstly, through engaging with the Tamma, we will be granting existentialism its climax and resolution. We can all finally put down our coffee and cigarettes and go home, or, rather, to the monastery. Secondly, by interpreting the Tamma through Heidegger and Sartre, we will also be injecting some of that sweet existential angst into our understanding of the Buddha's message. This angst, along with the precision of language and immediacy of the existentialist discourse, will ameliorate some of the stiffness and ontological calcification that Buddhism has accumulated over the millennia. Existentialism goes straight to the heart. So should the Tamma. Due to the inevitable entropic dullness and domestication the Tamma has endured over time, as well as the cultural gap that must be crossed, it can be difficult for the curious Westerner to discern any existential threat or admonishment emanating from what often amounts to a bald, smiling fat man sitting cross-legged in some robes. However, upon closer inspection, the spiritual ideal promoted in Buddhism's earliest text can elicit some more aversive reactions when exposed to modern Western ears. Exhortations like those in the following quotes begin to draw out the more macabre or asocial aspects of the Tamma, aspects that, judging by how frequently he seems to have taught them, the Buddha took with grave seriousness and have always been at odds with genteel sensibilities. One whose mind is enmeshed in sympathy for friends and companions neglects the true goal. Seeing this danger in intimacy, wander alone like a rhinoceros. See this fancy puppet, a body built of sores, diseased, obsessed over, in which nothing lasts at all. While the wise and holy hermit archetype is deeply integrated into Asian culture, we in the West often have a far less venerating, let alone understanding, attitude towards those who would voluntarily live apart from society. Indeed, after the cultural collapse in the 60s of puritanical, disciplinarian, or ascetic sensibilities carried over from Christianity, as well as the totalization of capitalist consumer culture, Values such as austerity or renunciation are perhaps even less comprehensible. To address this cultural divide, a secondary objective of this book will be to provide a thorough justification for seclusion and asceticism. Once again, this may seem completely irrelevant to the topic of nihilism, but I may remind the reader that the harbinger of nihilism himself, Frederick Nietzsche, was perhaps the greatest of all students of Arthur Schopenhauer, a philosopher whose conclusions led him to promote a life of asceticism and aesthetic contemplation. I assure the reader that Nietzsche's ultimate rejection and vigorous criticism of Schopenhauer's pessimism is well taken here. The Buddha did indeed encourage the abandonment of the world, as well as such things as the stilling of activity and personal effacement. However, Nietzsche's categorization of Buddhism as passive nihilism only holds at a superficial level. Through the external container of physical asceticism, the Buddha also encouraged the intensive cultivation of the powers of the mind, aiming his disciples towards minds that were concentrated, purified, bright, unblemished, rid of defilement, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability. A mind with discipline and endurance as indomitable as the earth, penetrating discernment, and nobility of comportment 
is the kind of power towards which we are instructed to direct our will. However, to my initial discomfort, the Buddha also presented all of the Tamma within a metaphysical framework that is, once again, completely contrary to Western sensibilities. Whether it is the apocalyptic, temporally finite Abrahamic cosmology or the skeptical, rational, materialist worldview presented in the physical sciences, the Buddhist mythos of hierarchical realms of existence populated by fantastic supernatural entities transmigrating through rebirth is anathema. Let me state at the outset that I very much sympathize with discomfort, if not outright disdain, towards any notions of the supernatural. My exploration of Buddhism only began out of sheer existential desperation, a deep need to put an end to the futility of endless transvaluation, and I carried an intense defensive skepticism into my initial engagement with the Tamma. Though there is no tradition of faith policing in Buddhism and little emphasis on hierarchical bodies mandating doctrinal or interpretive frameworks, practitioners are, for the most part, left completely to their own devices to resolve any doubts that go deeper than the most common surface-level expressions of skepticism. So, beyond whatever distinct intellectual project this book represents, a major motivation for my writing it is that I have yet to find a single tradition or teacher in the Buddhist world that is both adequately equipped to speak to radical skepticism and also makes a point of doing so thoroughly, publicly, and explicitly. This is another very understandable situation, as such a phenomenon was simply not an issue that any of Buddhism's traditional forms ever had to deal with, and you're not going to find many Max Sterners amongst the usual Buddha-curious Western crowd. My skeptical readers, therefore, should consider this book to be their official gateway to the Buddhist world. I myself first approached Buddhism with a positively colonial attitude, attempting to plunder this tradition of all its resources while throwing out all that I deemed to be superstitious nonsense. So long as such an attitude is accompanied by a great deal of intellectual integrity and a seedling of humility, I can confirm from experience that such an initial approach is perfectly adequate. If you are willing to meet the Tamma where it is, grapple with its ideas and give its recommendations a thorough, sincere try, you may find that its wisdom, and even its radical character, far exceeds your own. Glenn Wallace has provocatively described today's smorgasbord of Buddhisms as a ruin, and I can personally attest that this is a perfectly adequate description of the intellectual environment that any would-be tomb raider will have to navigate in order to uncover the value that lies within. On the outskirts of our ruined city of Buddhism, there are thriving communities of tourists and ritualists selling souvenirs and engaging in traditions of devotion that originated who knows where or when. Each of the communities are doing very different and often contradictory things, but all saying that their rituals are those that were passed down directly from the Buddha himself. Yet, if you start to follow some of the archaeologists into the heart of the ruin, the obvious differences between the architecture of the outskirts and that within the center of the city make it clear that a lot has changed in 2,600 years, that the traditions of the extant Buddhist lineages aren't nearly as old or as uncorrupted as they might claim, and that it's hard to tell whether the changes were for better or worse. 
Uncovering the truth behind the ruin takes effort, discernment, scholarship, integrity, and a willingness to question the neat and tidy narratives that serve as the foundation of contemporary Buddhism's self-identity. I think skeptics from all walks of life are very well equipped to undertake this labor and reap the benefits. And there are, indeed, plentiful benefits to be had, even in mundane terms. I thought I had questioned everything down to the ground, but the Tamma exposed within me a whole host of assumptions, false imaginings, and prejudices that I would have never otherwise recognized. In this way, the Tamma can actually function as a valuable tool for the committed skeptic and truth seeker, so long as they are willing to turn the knife on themselves. In doing so, you may find that the city you were born in is also a ruin. You just never cared to notice before. Thus, by coming into authentic, sympathetic conversation with skepticism, I hope to challenge the secular assumptions that underlie much of the spiritual malaise and dysfunction seen in the world today and provide a tenable alternative. For effectively disentangling ourselves from the global hegemonic culture of humanistic materialism will be crucial to resolving the anxiety and insecurity that drives us further into financial and emotional debt and away from the most pressing issues of life. So, if you are a dogmatic adherent to the ideals and metaphysics of modernity and are simply looking for a flavor of Buddhism that can be easily metabolized into a new psycho-spiritual therapeutic modality, you best look elsewhere. Given the domination of non-renunciate feel-good praxis within Western Buddhism, you will not have to look very far. If it has no other merits whatsoever, I hope at the very least that the contents of this book will render it impossible to be appropriated by the American self-help industry. I will not be offering up another example of a soteriologically neutered, socially engaged, secular Buddhism. Whether it has a rationalist or New Age flavor, Western Buddhism is often deeply antinomian and world-friendly. While such expressions of religiosity are no doubt authentically Buddhist in the socio-historical sense, I must state that I will be advocating an approach to the Tamma that, following the earliest texts, stands directly opposed to such conceptions of spirituality. Domesticating the Tamma into a reasonable and empirical though archaic, philosophical system that may be comfortably consumed, appreciated for its lack of insistence on any particular oaths of faith or fealty, and then placed back on the bookshelf, ignores the single non-negotiable prerequisite for entering into discipleship with the Buddha. An openness to the possibility that all of your most fundamental assumptions about the nature of happiness and all of your most cherished habits of thought and behavior are entirely, categorically, irretrievably misguided. Existentialism may be a humanism, but the Tama is certainly not. In his foundational work on the topic the philosopher Robert Rosen wrote, Nihilism is a perennial human danger. It cannot be solved without the dissolution of human nature. I affirm and extol that such a dissolution is exactly what the Buddha described and prescribed. What must be done in response to the recognition of throneness, in response to nihilistic absurdity, and in response to the perpetual pressure and stress of simply existing, goes directly against the grain of the most fundamental human assumptions 
and the structure of every society that has ever existed. The Tama is deeply, deeply radical, and our foray into existentialism is intended only to highlight and enhance that radicalism. We will be staring deeply into the abyss. For this, we must do to finally cure ourselves of Nietzsche's uncanniest of all guests. But is our situation truly so dire to warrant such desperate measures? Is life really so terrible in so many ways that we must undo human nature? That is, of course, a question that every person must decide for herself. But let me count the ways. Chapter 1. The Situation Peril stems from those who take up arms. Just look at people in conflict. I shall extol how I came to be stirred with a sense of urgency. I saw this population flounder like fish in a little puddle. Seeing them fight each other, fear came upon me. The world around was hollow. All directions were in turmoil. Wanting a home for myself, I saw nowhere unsettled. Sutanipata 4.15 Though the structure of our now globalized society continues to do its best to prevent serious people from asking serious questions, in recent years I think it has become apparent to even the most flippant among us that something is very wrong with the ideological framework within which our lives are lived. As if the death of God weren't enough, now the sense of Fukuyamian self-assuredness in capitalist liberal democracy, an economic and political ideal now showing its age at three centuries old, has been finally brought to a breaking point by new and unprecedented economic, social, geopolitical, and ecological realities. At a staggering pace, layer upon layer of collective myth has eroded from underneath our feet, leaving us grasping and reeling for anything solid to hold on to. Of course, such a solid thing will never be found, but we may well do a bit of cultural geology both to assess the extent of the damage and to survey the wide world of human bondage, vexation, futility, and stress. For our topsoil, we might first name economics, an obvious realm of human concern. Rather than capitalism being the economic stage between feudalism and socialism, as was held by Marx, it appears capitalism was simply an interim period for the development and maturation of feudalism, bridging the gap between Renaissance feudalism and the sophistication of what is now being termed corporate neo-feudalism. The cyberpunk aesthetic of towering corporate strongholds surrounded by the flashing lights of advertisements beaming down onto the unwashed masses of powerless, drug-addled digital escapists appears to be becoming more like fact than fiction. Democracy has always been far more of an ideal than a reality, but the discrepancy between the real structural power of hegemonic global finance and the voting public has, over the past 40 years, grown too large to any longer convincingly support old stabilizing social narratives surrounding equal opportunity, civic duty, or patriotic fraternity. As such, scale-invariant tribalism is on the ascendancy worldwide. Western politics, in the same spirit of post-irony that most of our other cultural spaces now inhabit, has embraced a fully theatrical character, 
in degrees shedding the inhibitions of sanctimonious conceit. Politics, to use the terminology of that enduring form of morality play we call professional wrestling, has broken kayfabe. Malthusian pressures, unprecedented age demographic crises, ecological collapse, supply chain disruption and relocalization, as well as the looming but ambiguous threats of peak oil and global climate change are gradually changing family dynamics and consumption habits, forcing many young adults in the developed world to curtail their expectations about the kind of life they and their very small number of children can expect to have. In the same way you can engage in simulated, ineffectual politics on social media, we may also now simulate social cohesion and spiritual significance in a wide marketplace of fandoms, body idolatry, and religious role-play. Political tribalism may be all the rage to both engage in and complain about, but it is these three activities that form the most subtly pernicious and ubiquitous forms of tribalism in our society. Pointing out the abject decadence of fandom culture is likely uncontroversial and not in any particular need of further analysis, beyond the clarification that in the designation of fandoms I am including not just video games, Marvel movies, and anime, but also professional athletics and music of all kinds. The body idolatry of the contemporary wellness and longevity movements is a more tantalizing subject, but what makes it idolatry rather than simply informed and engaged expressions of personal stewardship is its spiritual context. In the West and all of the West's cultural satellites, which is essentially the entire world at this point, such a spiritual context, as briefly mentioned in the introduction, is deeply lacking. Though often unrecognized, nihilism is naturally the major source of this less-than-ideal spiritual climate. The reason for nihilism's lack of visibility, despite the fact that its visibility has been rising in recent times, is that its most common expressions are entirely implicit. The common nihilist is no reader of Cioran or Schopenhauer. Rather, it's the person who has never picked up a book of philosophy in their life and just doesn't really care, and does what they please. One may bring to mind the evocative climax of The Godfather in which the ascendant mob boss Michael Corleone affirms to a priest at the baptism of his child that he rejects Satan, while the gruesome results of Michael's orders to have all his criminal rivals brutally murdered are cut into the ceremony. It is easy to imagine such striking hypocrisies repeated countless times in Italy and the rest of Christendom since the very beginning. At least Alexander the Great or Genghis Khan weren't being hypocrites. Pointing out the implicit nihilism in the act of sin, though nihilism itself may not be explicitly named, is a well-worn topic of Jewish, Christian, and Islamic sermons. But simply leaving it at, ah, well, I'm not a murderer, I believe in the right God, and I pay my taxes, so heaven here I come, is spiritually naive at best. Given the way that politics is starting to take on a quasi-religious emotive character, it seems that most people intuitively feel the inadequacy of such an outlook there's a real depth to the pent-up yearning for making something meaningful of our lives in the modern world, as that yearning has so very few authentic avenues of expression in our society. The hopelessness of the capitalist worldview I wrote of in the introduction has become so total that people are en masse reaching out for just about anything that could provide an alternative to the listless, mechanical, 
trivial existence of turning their lives into a number on a banker's computer screen. This dynamic of nihilism and quiet desperation is so old that it was even recognized by Thoreau in the 1800s, and though it has been intensified by our peculiar social conditions, we are all individually culpable for allowing it to take hold and reproduce itself in our bodies and minds. So, let me provide a little trans-religious sermon of my own to more fully illustrate this source of humanity's enduring spiritual weakness. I'll begin my sermon with an anecdote. When I was in university and walking the halls, I would often pass a group of Muslim students sitting together, studying and socializing, displaying the natural insularity of American minority groups everywhere. Ever a student of humanity, I would often attempt to slow my walking pace and eavesdrop a bit on such groups to put my finger on the pulse of a culture that I had little other direct opportunities to encounter. One day, I saw and heard the women of the group drawing attention to and complimenting a colorful, fashionable headscarf newly purchased by one of their members, and I was floored by this seemingly innocuous conversation. There is a perception in America, founded on a great deal of truth in my experience, that our minority Middle Eastern and Indian populations are very conservative, family-oriented, and resistant to the secular decadence of American life. But after seeing this small example of religious commodification, all I could think to myself was, the process has begun. I think to some extent we can all vaguely feel the decadence contained in the subtle cultural movements this anecdote exemplifies, but what is often unseen and unexplored is the nature of decadence. What we have in the headscarf example is a very subtle but tangible hypocrisy between the modesty that is the ostensible purpose of a headscarf and the vanity of fashion. It's not at the level of Don Corleone, but it's there. Going a bit deeper, we have a conflict in values between two competing ideologies and, more importantly, the incentive structures of those ideologies. On one hand, we have the salvation and virtue granted through submission to Allah. On the other, we have the pleasure, entertainment, and ease of conscience granted by the secular capitalist world. Even this understanding just described is a relatively commonplace one. But the deeper ramifications of such subtle lapses in virtue are often not considered by religious believers, for such considerations would be inevitably uncomfortable. Insofar as you tell yourself that you value virtue, any breach or even minor compromise of that virtue is direct, tangible evidence that you don't believe what you say you do. There are complex theological, psychological, and sociological mechanisms for suppressing this kind of revelation. Christians can point to original sin and Buddhists or Hindus can claim that their unskillful actions were conditioned by karma, but these are classic examples of what Sartre called bad faith. These cop-outs are covering up the very real truth that your choices are your values. Your values are not out there somewhere in the ether of a material brain or the soul residing in some platonic metaspace or the karmic astral plane or whatever, they are built out of and manifest in countless ethical choices that can assault you without warning at any time, every conscious moment of your life. This is all very standard existentialist discourse, but one concept emphasized by the Buddha that can enrich it further 
is the emotional relationship we maintain with our metaphysical beliefs, with our assumptions about the nature of self and world. There is a notion in Abrahamic religions that subjugating oneself and opening totally and exclusively to the will of God is a humble, noble, selfless decision compared to the selfish and base path of worldly things and vice. This kind of view is less common in the Buddhist world, though forms of it are still there. Zen monks burning their fingers off have much in common with Christian martyrs. What is not often recognized in such displays is the deep amount of gratification that people extract from their beliefs. The difficulty in recognizing that gratification comes from the fact that it is much more of a slow burn than pleasures of the more carnal variety, on top of the fact that acknowledging just how self-centered our devotion truly is would often be embarrassing, if not completely destabilizing. But it's not very hard to pull down the facade, just question their beliefs and most people react as strongly as if you'd just slapped them in the face. People feed voraciously on the apparent security their identity grants them, and even the most beautiful, noble, laborious, and compassionate actions have some aspect of instant gratification to them. I once heard a cocaine addict talk about how a big part of his addiction was simply the need to purchase and possess the cocaine without necessarily even needing to use it. Just the security of knowing that it was there and available for future use was relief in itself. This surprisingly insightful analysis is incredibly valuable in understanding all the more complex aspects of the human condition. Far, far more than pleasure itself, people value the idea of pleasure. We value the security of believing ourselves to be in a world where comfort and pleasure are readily and easily accessible, and discomfort and pain are distant and preventable. Whether it's the security of believing in the certainty of a heavenly afterlife or the certainty of your next drug fix, the principle is the same. You may deem it reductionist and offensive to equivocate between faith and drug addiction, but, as previously discussed, such faith is, in action, often not as deep as we might like to believe. In fact, faith is always internally objectified and commodified. It is made into a fetish of security against the pressures of life against the threat of nihilism, and yet the nihilism is still right there in the slipperiness of the fetish. A headscarf fetish signifying piety simultaneously signifies group membership and can be easily co-opted to further signify individual beauty, conspicuous consumption, and freedom of expression. In other words... It is co-opted by the very same hedonic impulses and attitudes that support the adoption of the initial noble ideal. The domination of the pleasure principle remains. The longing of the heart can be covered over in innumerable ways, and since none of them ever actually resolve the longing... Keeping any one of the methods solid or pure is ultimately impossible. The craving will eventually slip out for a midnight snack to get its fix. If faith were actually enough, we wouldn't build cathedrals. This is what gives capitalism its character as decadence essentialized. Decadence is the slipping and sliding of the fundamental impulse towards gratification into every and any available expression that catches our fancy. 
Capitalism is simply the most recent and most totalized form of the beginningless impulse for individuals and their cultures to expand themselves to meet this proliferation and now, under capitalism, to even encourage it. And yet, no matter how insatiable and unfocused people recognize their craving to be, so long as the idea that it will eventually be quenched remains intact, they will continue to unreflectively wallow in the mud. All that I described can be easily appropriated to reinforce the awe of the believer in the compassion of their creator over such wretched beings as us. There's really no getting around the need to address this, so... Let's look a little closer at this monotheistic compassion. Intuitively, life lived with our limbs extended into every honeypot that comes our way, although we may become trapped by this, is at least an adequate means of coping with this mortal coil until we may enjoy the splendor, or at least the oblivion, of death. Well... I'm sure you've already guessed that your Eeyore author is not going to let Pooh Bear enjoy his honey in peace. Let's assume that the monotheism of your choice is all completely true. And now, let's suppose that we're all dead right now, that we all acted in the right ways and believed the right things to qualify for entry into paradise. Oh my god. Goodness, it's so wonderful. I don't even know what to do first. Now stop. Right there, right in the very first moment of eternal bliss, we already have <gasps> our first bit of suffering. There was the subtle stress of a mind overwhelmed with all the possibilities for gratification, the insecurity of the impulse to suck it all in as quickly as possible, the uncertainty of not knowing where to prioritize our attention. Even if we have free lifetime tickets, upon walking through the gates of the theme park, we still need to choose what ride to go on first. And as any vacationing parent can tell you, having to make such choices is inevitably just a tad annoying. We are met here with the inescapable reality that the very need to engage with perfection necessarily conditions a less than perfect experience. Far beyond the taint of sin, consciousness and free will themselves have been revealed to be a vessel of imperfection. Let's flag this as the tiny straw problem of salvation. This is a problem that besets any soteriology that is very physical in nature. Physical in the sense that it basically posits a metaphysical, cleaned-up version of the world we live in now. People in this kind of heaven never die or age or feel pain and basically have superpowers and there's an infinite abundance of pleasurable objects to enjoy but the fundamental way that it's all experienced is through some kind of concrete, finite analog of the physical body. In this kind of heaven, there would always still be that subtle pressure of looking for what's next and what's new. At the very least, we would need to learn to chill out and let infinity flow over us. There would be the impulse to explore this newly opened capacity for a relationship with God, attempting to contemplate and glorify the infinite. But this contemplation would always ultimately fail due to the finite reality of the sense experience that contemplation would occur within. The infinite can never adequately fit into the finite. If our memory remained functional and perpetually intact, we would also, after the equivalent of a few trillion years, eventually just get bored. You can only wade through an infinity of perfection for so long until the impulse to be further bombarded with bliss would begin to fade. 
it would all start to seem a bit absurd. Even, dare I say it, pointless. Has nihilism followed us even into heaven? There's just so much to infinity. Always something new, always something blissful, yet, in that way, never anything new, never anything impactful. You might start to become a little indifferent, a little aloof, a little restrained. Maybe some dispassion would start to creep in, hmm? You might just sit down and start to meditate. Of course, this is not the only idea of salvation out there. The tiny straw problem points to the limitations and very subtle stresses involved with literally just existing with an appetite for pleasure that must be volitionally sought out with finite senses contained within space and time. This problem can be addressed by effectively expanding the straw and arbitrarily modifying our idea about what the heavenly mind will be like until we reach the natural conclusion of total union with the Godhead. We could discuss in detail the issues that might arise with more abstract but non-unitary theories of salvation like the beatific vision. I think, however, the point has been made that anything less than total union would entail some very tiny level of dissatisfaction, imperfection, in what is supposed to be a perfect existence. Yet, when we talk about any and all hypothetical alien ways of existence that are perfect, infinite, without time and space, etc., when we talk about the experience of being God, we are, of course, speaking of something that cannot even be conceived of, let alone understood. As such, when we speak of such things, we are not actually talking about happiness anymore. We're not talking about anything that has any precedent or relationship with human experience. Such a state cannot even be considered desirable. For what criteria could something like that be judged by, even hypothetically? Regarding something such as this as salvation is equally absurd as stating that the number 42 is the meaning of life. It's a category error of the most egregious character. Bringing things back down to earth, it is for these same reasons that all humanistic theories of salvation are also completely insufficient. From our analysis of any and all metaphysical heavens, we can see clearly that luxury gay space communism will not solve the problem. That all the pleasure in the world can be and indeed already is corrupted by what ultimately amounts to an attitude problem, exposes the deep futility that underlies modernist notions of progress. The abolition of scarcity and class distinctions will not abolish suffering, for even the bourgeois suffer, as does Jean-Luc Picard. And all of this remains at a level of experience that totally precedes volition. To speak of the volitional aspect of primordial human dissatisfaction, we need not look for any better description of the willful human impulse to mayhem and discontent than that which was presented by Dostoevsky. Shower upon him every earthly blessing, drown him in a sea of happiness so that nothing but bubbles of bliss can be seen on the surface. Give him economic prosperity such that he should have nothing else to do but sleep, eat cakes, and busy himself with the continuation of his species. And even then, out of sheer ingratitude, sheer spite, man would play you some nasty trick. He would even risk his cakes and would deliberately desire the most fatal rubbish the most uneconomical absurdity, 
simply to introduce into all this positive good sense his fatal fantastic element. Our analysis of perfection through the total transformation of consciousness into something totally hypothetical and other also completely annihilates the dreams of the transhuman project, as well as the temptation of suicide. There are those who believe that human suffering is a problem contained in the abstract theoretical entity commonly known as the nervous system, and that if this entity were modified or destroyed, all our problems could be solved. Even if such people admit that lack of pleasure or presence of pain is not the core issue, they may still hold out in the hopes that whatever material process it is that causes dissatisfaction could eventually be ameliorated by genetic, pharmaceutical, cybernetic, or traumatic ballistic interventions. The advantages of having a different kind of brain, or none at all, the ramifications such a transformation might bring is an idea that can only be contemplated within the evaluative framework that already exists right now, a framework whose assumptions would no longer apply to ways of being that are, by definition, outside the framework. Logical positivism as a whole may have been a philosophical dead end, but there is wisdom in the maxim whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. The whole foolish notion of things existing outside the framework is actually deeply intertwined with the whole unenlightened process of craving and suffering, but that is a discussion we will save for later chapters. We thus arrive at the lament voiced by Wittgenstein that even if all possible scientific questions be answered, the problems of life have still not been touched at all. Every attempt we make at understanding and manipulating the world around us, all the hopes we have about our God or our ambitions saving us from our plight, all are born out of the very same craving that will still be there even if we achieve everything our hearts desire. For the satisfaction of desire is not actually how we derive gratification from the world. As we saw in the cocaine example, the gratification is already present in the attitude of anticipation. This is a dynamic that can be seen directly for yourself. If you're still in the business of riding the pleasure boat, the next time you indulge yourself, just try to actually pay attention to where the enjoyment is coming from. What parts of, say, a wonderful meal are actually the good parts on a moment-to-moment -moment basis? Is it in the actual tastes themselves? Or is it in all the narratives you tell yourself about how you're going to love this food, the Anticipation of sitting at the table knowing that the good feels are on their way. The act of socially valorizing, glamorizing, and delighting in what you're experiencing with the people around you. Oh, this is so good. If you pay attention to these things and compare them to the immediate experience of tasting the food, you may notice that the pleasure experience itself is relatively hollow and unfulfilling. It's just there, dead as a log. It takes all the effort of our willful, reactionary, emotional explosion to take that dead pleasure and turn it into something actually enjoyable. We delight in delight itself, not the objects of our delight. Or in the words of the Buddha, greedy intention is a person's sensual pleasure. The world's pretty things stay just as they are. Incidentally, whenever the words sensual or sensuality are used in Buddhist circles, 
they generally have a broader meaning than the narrowly sexual connotation that word often carries. For a while, I wondered why translators didn't instead use a word like sensory in order to avoid that confusion, but as my understanding of the Tama grew, I started to recognize how thematically valuable it was to leverage the emotional intensity of that sexual connotation and expand it to the totality of our interactions with pleasure and pain. If you pay even closer attention to this curious phenomenon that is sensuality, you will inevitably start to notice that all of that valorization and delight, despite granting a relative gratification, simultaneously contains within it a fundamental, inescapable tension, a yearning of the heart, an insecurity, and agitation. This is what the Buddha called dukkha. Often translated as suffering or stress, a less evocative but perhaps more fully universalized way of translating it would be to take the concrete noun problem and transform it, as I did once in the introduction, into the abstract proper noun problem. There are problems... And then there is the capacity to have problems, the very essence of the experience of having a problem. This is what we refer to as problem. Dukkha is problem. And you can see for yourself, if you only wish to look, that problem is an attitude problem. Dukkha is so pernicious precisely because it involves continually ignoring the fact that it's our attitude towards what we conceive to be the problem, the very tendency to conceive the problem in terms of pleasure and pain, that is itself the problem. This is what the Buddha called avijja, or ignorance. We ignore that all the gratification we get by pursuing pleasure is directly and inexorably bound up with the very dukkha that gratification is attempting to escape. The pleasure of gratification is impossible to experience without simultaneously, at the exact same moment, experiencing the pain of separation from the desired. Insofar as we repeatedly choose to reify and identify with this fundamental framework of pursuit and gratification, we will never see that what we should actually be pursuing is freedom from gratification itself. If such a self-destructive pursuit appears to be a paradox, craving to end craving, it only appears that way because the framework of your intentions, the framework of your entire world, is so thoroughly bound up with a self-same identification with sensuality that you, understandably, cannot comprehend the difference between intentionality and craving. This is quite natural, as immersion in craving is where we all begin, and, as such, the end of craving must indeed be initially born out of craving. We will return to this later, but for now we might simply state that the disambiguation between intentionality and craving is a project that can reap transcendentally valuable rewards. Because sensuality and its resulting tukha have absolutely nothing to do with the kinds of feelings and perceptions that contact our senses and everything to do with the attitude by which we engage with and interpret that contact, no external experience or achievement can ever offer us what we hope it will. Getting Enough Instagram followers will not solve problem. Winning enough games will not solve problem. 
Seeing enough movies will not solve problem. Having enough sex will not solve problem. Earning the esteem of your society will not solve problem. Making enough money will not solve problem. Having enough intimate, fulfilling relationships will not solve problem. Helping enough people will not solve problem. Destroying the patriarchy will not solve problem. Removing the degenerates and reestablishing the true faith will not solve problem. Saving the planet will not solve problem. Developing a physical theory of everything will not solve problem. Killing yourself will not solve problem. Becoming immortal will not solve problem. Going to heaven will not solve problem. Becoming one with the universe will not solve problem. Ignoring all of this and just going about your life until you die will not solve problem. The reason why I went into some detail on salvation, on those highest imagined goods from cultures around the world, is that our lack of clarity regarding the things we desire and the things we believe is really the only reason why we're able to keep desiring and believing them in the first place. Whenever you start to tone down the valorization, when you actually just take a step back from the narrative of your life as it is now and whatever it is you believe about the hereafter, what inevitably starts to seep in is a very natural sense of disenchantment. So much conflict in the world is so concentrated on and wrapped up in poking holes in the beliefs of the other side blaming them for all the world's problems instead of actually just playing the tape forward on our own beliefs. If we would do this, we would start to see the inadequacies intrinsic to our own most deeply held convictions. When you simply accept the theory of the world that has been drilled into you by your culture it is easy to never consider the tape-playing exercises I have just described because the very habit of not engaging in these exercises is the scale-invariant fabric out of which your entire world is woven. For if you did dare to look, what you would see is that what we hold as good, what we hold as enough will, when you look closely at it, never actually be good enough. Because good enough is an attitude, a choice. Thus, it is not something that God or the Buddha can grant you from on high. It's a choice that you need to make and continue to make and train and drill and study and understand until good enough is no longer even an issue. And that will be good enough. Out of the confusion of the 2010s and the pressure cooker of quarantine, there seems to have emerged some distributed sense of self-reflection, a growing level of sobriety and authentic self-doubt about what it really is that we're all doing with our lives, emotionally, practically, and intellectually. This reflection is healthy, but what I have tried to indicate here is that so long as it stays on the level of economics, politics, culture, and science, it's not ultimately ever going to end up leading to anywhere worth going. There is so much abundance in the world today, so much Ease of access to things previous generations of humans would have considered entirely relegated to the realm of the gods. Yet, so many of us are still absolutely miserable. There are cultural movements preempting the inevitable economic and ecological necessity of returning to simpler, less comfortable, but more meaningful ways of life, but what I hope to have made clear is that even the most conventionally wholesome, connected, stable life is 
still bound up with subtle levels of stress and agitation. Agitation that will eventually spill out into social and personal corrosion. Such is the nature of tangha, or craving. Recognizing the arbitrary, groundless yearning of our intellectual and emotional lives, recognizing the reality and futility of endless transvaluation, is what the experience of nihilism is all about. And so long as it is you in the paradise of your dreams and not some hypothetical, incomprehensibly perfect replacement doppelganger, nihilism and dukkha will follow. Nihilism, insofar as it is equivalent to this stepping back movement and the rise of disenchantment, is actually a good thing so long as it does not descend into total despair, heedlessness, or bitter resignation, nihilism is equivalent to the Pali term samkwega. Scholar monk Tanisaro Piku describes samkwega as the oppressive sense of shock, dismay, and alienation that come with realizing the futility and meaninglessness of life as it's normally lived, a chastening sense of our own complacency and foolishness in having let ourselves live so blindly, and an anxious sense of urgency in trying to find a way out of the meaningless cycle. Admittedly, for me, learning that such a poly word even existed was a deeply emotional experience as I desperately mined this strange foreign religion for any potential solution to the existential predicament in which we find ourselves. There it was. Evidence that the Buddha understood the problem that we are faced with in such a deep way that such a subtle and complicated emotion as existential angst was baked right into the very language the Tama has been preserved within. It's as solid a communication as if it were chiseled into stone by the Buddha himself. Though they may be able to see some of the truth in what I am describing here, I am sure there are many readers who, at this point, have become a bit exacerbated at my insistence on pointing out all the subtle stresses involved in what are commonly conceived to be the best parts of life and even the afterlife, calling them all futile because they're not absolutely perfect. Such a cosmological level of discontent may appear to be immature entitlement and persnickettiness taken to the absolute extreme. There is also likely pushing back against me the common and highly generalized glorification of suffering present in the West. Such an attitude is unsurprising, given that a man in agony has literally been the highest image of sanctity in our culture for thousands of years. My response to the insistence that suffering can be a good thing that struggle often accompanies the best and most meaningful parts of life, is partial agreement. Suffering can indeed be a good thing when put towards a higher cause, but such struggle should be pursued intelligently. I assert it as axiomatic that all human effort is invariably directed towards the avoidance of suffering. We have already discussed how, through our ability to take gratification in sacrifice towards higher ideals, that avoidance of suffering can take on a very complex character. I'm simply proffering the modest suggestion that if an end to this whole story of suffering is possible, it might be a good idea to investigate that rather than wasting a great deal of effort on projects that will never ultimately be complete. 
the tragedy that the Buddha is trying to help us avoid is going through a whole mass of suffering that never actually ends the suffering that was itself the motivation for us going through all the suffering. The Tama is pointing to the core of the issue that we keep running circles around. And I understand being skeptical about the possibility that all suffering could be entirely eliminated. There's nothing I or anyone else could ever say or write to remove all doubt about that. You can't ever know for sure that it's possible to solve Tukha until you try for yourself and succeed. So, even if you're still skeptical, you might continue reading on if only so that you'll have some ideas to try in case the eternity you will eventually spend not being alive isn't everything you had hoped for. But to further respond to any resolute optimists, I do not wish it to go unnoticed that in all previous discussions we have exclusively focused on all the suffering involved in simply riding the merry-go-round of the good life. We have imagined ourselves as movie stars, but simply fast-forwarded to the day that we get up out of our expensive bed with our beautiful body, walk to the bathroom, and proceed to stare into the mirror for half an hour, somehow hoping to find something in those eyes that will finally fill the hole. But as we all know, though we may distract ourselves to avoid the recognition, that body is not going to remain beautiful forever. There is perhaps not a lot that needs to be said about the other side of life. Workplace drudgery, social drama, heartbreak, financial problems, illness, war, aging, and death. We will inevitably experience many of these things, for they will either occur to us or to our friends and relatives throughout our life, while the final one, death, is an inevitability. These are topics that the Buddha encouraged us all to dwell on and become comfortable with, but without a thorough relinquishing of pleasure, it is almost impossible to truly make peace with pain. People can intellectually come to grips with the reality of death and even welcome it, after having lived what they deem to be a full life, but what is most difficult to accept is the fact that it is that same attitude of sensuality that we feed on in life that causes us such suffering in death. It is exactly your white-knuckle grip on your family, your property, your identity, and your pleasures that is the cause of all the pain you will feel when those things are inevitably wrenched from your hands. You can do your best to preemptively loosen your grip by dipping your toe into Buddhist philosophy and meditation, but it is ultimately only through asceticism and renunciation that you will be able to meaningfully let go. The same grip that binds you to pleasure also binds you to pain. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. Once the poison in the cake is recognized, the only thing left to do is to get up and leave it behind. In the many ways I have spent this chapter elaborating, Sangvega has been and will continue to be vindicated. We are all adrift in stories that are constantly falling apart, frantically weaving different value structures and narratives together as if our life were one big tapestry, rapidly fraying at the edges and rotting from the middle. And even if we were able to somehow overcome entropy, complete the tapestry, and put it in a vacuum case and hang it in a museum, 
Then all we would get to do is just stand there and look at a stupid tapestry. But most of us keep weaving anyway. What else is there? Well, the Buddha claims that there is something else. That there is a way to go about changing your attitude so that you can finally stop identifying with this whole flashing vortex of pleasure and pain and stories about self and world. There is a way to extract yourself from the whirlpool and finally have some peace. Part of this vortex, what is called samsara in Buddhist cosmology, is the whole realm of philosophy, science, and intellectual inquiry in general. The need for answers, the need to form a coherent abstract concept of self and world and all that that means, is itself part of samsara. Through understanding this playground of nihilism, and through understanding the nature, motivation, and the limits of intellectual certainty, we will have taken a step towards renouncing that certainty and the world towards which it is directed. It's time to do some metaphysics. Chapter 2 Metaphysics our unkillable companion. For one who is involved gets embroiled in disputes about teachings. But how to dispute with the uninvolved? About what? For picking up and putting down is not what they do. They have shaken off all views in this very life. Sutanipata 4.3 If there is one phrase we might use to summarize 20th century philosophy, it is context matters. Insofar as we conceive metaphysics to be the context by which all of reality is interpreted, the previous century was then a golden age of metaphysics, though it began by heading in the opposite direction. In the early 1900s, there was an increasingly focused attempt to provide a solid, formal foundation to all of logic and mathematics. Being that mathematics is itself the foundation of science, and science was becoming the foundation of our entire society, it seemed an important task to actually go down into the basement, clear out all the cobwebs, organize the crawl space, and Make sure everything was stable down there. There is no doubt that, for some, part of the motivation for this Foundations project was also to finally gather up all the crucifixes that might be lurking down there, bringing them up into the art gallery and finally, once and for all, banishing the whole of metaphysics and superstition into the annals of an unenlightened past. But what philosophers and mathematicians like Frege, Russell, Wittgenstein, and Gödel found upon descending to the deepest of the deepest sub-basements was, to extend the metaphor with only a modicum of hyperbole, a black hole. The unresolvable limitations on the power and justification for logic and mathematics is an incredibly technical subject that is ultimately spiritually irrelevant to any but the most Pythagorean of mystics. Wittgenstein's investigations into the limits of philosophy and meaning itself, however, are both crucial to any comprehensive understanding of nihilism and when put in broad terms, also relatively easy to understand. Wittgenstein's general thrust is perhaps best illustrated in examining his rule-following paradox that was described by Saul Kripke as the most radical and original skeptical problem that philosophy has seen to date. 
Whenever we are involved in any kind of communication, there is a general understanding that we have to follow particular rules in order for that communication to be meaningful. This sentence abides by particular rules of English grammar uh, that we all learned at some point in our lives in order to be able to engage in the activities of reading and writing as we are doing now. If I did not follow these rules, or you did not know those rules, communication in this form would be impossible. All the symbols would be a bunch of gibberish, and we would have to resort to some other kind of communication in order to get information across meaningfully. The rule-following paradox is that, for any expression I could make, there are infinitely many different sets of rules that could have motivated me to make the particular expression I did. This sentence you're reading right now could have been composed with the intention for it to be read and interpreted using a completely different set of rules than those of the English language. Even if I made and communicated a rule about which rules you need to follow in order to interpret this sentence correctly, the rule I made about the rules would itself have infinitely many different possibilities for interpretation. Thus, because A. We can never be sure about what rules anybody is following when they make the expressions they do, B. Different sets of rules could lead to the same expressions being interpreted in completely contradictory ways, and C. Those rules are the arbiter of meaningfulness. The natural conclusion is that meaning is impossible. As I said, we've found a black hole in the basement. Coming as it does from such a fundamental place, there is no aspect of contemporary intellectual life that this anti-foundationalist movement has left untouched. There is naturally much more that could be discussed regarding those fundamentals, let alone all the secondary impacts, what with meaning itself being in question. But I think the single example of the rule-following paradox has made the basic picture relatively clear. If you are confused about why Western culture has become gripped in a fit of nihilistic, tribalistic moral relativism, you have your answer right here. This problem, this nihilistic death spiral we're trapped in isn't just a cultural fad or a conspiracy of the postmodern neo-Marxists. Nobody is more intimately knowledgeable of and invested in the project of Western culture than the thinkers who have spent their lives investigating these things. You can call it a scandal, but it's more appropriate to call it a tragedy. The tragedy of philosophy. This absurd groundlessness is an absolutely foundational problem built right into the nature of logic itself. Of course, practically speaking, life goes on. All the philosophers remain employed, and we go right on speaking, blissfully ignorant of or indifferent to the metaphysics of what we're doing. If you're a god-of-the-gaps kind of person, our basement black hole is a great place to stick the Almighty. Though remember that our crisis of interpretation applies to every holy text in existence, including those of Buddhism. On the one hand, this crisis undermines our ability to settle definitively on any one metaphysical view of reality for any such view can never have any one definitive interpretation once it's been expressed in concrete terms, whether that be in Holy Scripture or in the mathematical expressions defining some hypothetical physical theory of everything. 
It's always just going to be turtles all the way down. In this way, metaphysics would appear to be impossible. Yet, we cannot seem to do without it, for living a human life is impossible without some basic assumptions about what is real and valuable and what isn't. Context matters and cannot be done without. It's also impossible to abandon metaphysics for technical reasons, as Derrida describes. All these destructive discourses and all their analogs are trapped in a kind of circle. This circle is unique. It describes the form of the relation between the history of metaphysics and the destruction of the history of metaphysics. There is no sense in doing without the concepts of metaphysics in order to shake metaphysics. We have no language, no syntax, and no lexicon which is foreign to this history. We can pronounce not a single destructive proposition which has not already had to slip into the form, the logic, and the implicit postulations of precisely what it seeks to contest. That the sensical can only be made of by the assumption of the sensical exposes the fractal, self-referential, holographic, self-justifying, and arbitrary nature of our image of the world. The divide between the practical, manifest image of normativity and common sense on one hand and the scientific image of reason and empiricism on the other has been shattered, and philosophy re-naturalized into the singular project of a humanity bewildered and bound with a mind. Once metaphysics was recognized by Nietzsche to be human, all too human, we then naturally wandered by stages to the Foucauldian idea of knowledge as power, and only power. With lives contained in our collective myths reduced to their Hobbesian state of nature, there remains only the will, unconstrained in the pursuit of its appetites. Nietzsche, with a prophecy still as resonant today as it was 150 years ago, proclaimed to us the Ubermensch, who would go beyond petty human values that tie us down with arbitrary limits and transcend the embarrassment of having ever been a simple ape such as we. But the futility of the eternal repetition of power justifying power, the futility of the eternal return cannot ultimately be ignored. The powerful trap themselves in their power. They become a slave to their power in the same movement by which they cast off the constraints of their much-despised slave morality. Furthermore, the very nature of power is constantly fluctuating, for the quality and quantity of our libidinal energy, spiritual dominance, and Capacity for self-overcoming must always be judged by a yesterday that has always already come and remains alive in the present as the weight of expectation. In both the affirmation and negation of life, of meaning, of mastery or slavery, we are either way invariably trapped and bound with craving for power. Always more. In authentic Samguega, the master and the slave are exposed as one and the same, naked in their equivalent humanity, their equivalent quivering dukkha. In taking power as the ground of being, in diving headfirst into the flood of passion, in loving one's fate, in imagining Sisyphus happy, we are thereby assured of our slavery. 
to continually revalue our values in line with the whims of our vitality is nothing other than the apish condition the Ubermensch seeks to escape. Even a master of the world writes a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. What Nietzsche could not recognize in his passion is that the urge to avoid suffering is invariant under transvaluation. Dukkha is what drives our urge to know, to understand, and to control. Dukkha keeps us spinning in the hermeneutic circle of life. It is the fuel for the universal engine of craving that spews the smoky exhaust in whose volume we use our trembling fingers to trace pictures of worlds to live our lives within. The essence of wisdom is to stop grasping at the smoke and to turn your full, undivided attention and effort towards the destruction of the engine and its fuel. Asceticism begins with the abandonment of the metaphysics of power and wisdom begins with the total weaponization of metaphysics in the war against suffering. When this is seen and understood, the seed that is the end of transvaluation, the end of nihilism, and the end of metaphysics has been well and truly planted. But what must be done to water such a seed remains a mystery a mystery that Heidegger astutely recognized, writing, Being has become manifest as a burden. Why that shouldn't be, one does not know. Despite his ignorance of the nature of suffering, by looking closely at the nature of existence as it is directly manifested in experience, Heidegger and the other phenomenologists were at least on the right track, because Dukkha is bound up with experience and our attitudes towards that experience. As such, those things must be fully known and understood before we can understand and thereby put an end to Dukkha. From the outside, the discipline dedicated to such direct knowing, phenomenology, can seem a rather pointless reflective exercise. Though they may have methodically observed and detailed some interesting aspects of the human experience that can and, for the most part, did go otherwise unnoticed, the method of phenomenology as a whole appears to have very limited practical application. Neuroscientists continue to go about their work partially, if not completely indifferent, to Merleau-Ponty's insistence that the conscious mind cannot ever be reduced to discrete, independent, and quantifiable sensations directly linked to similarly structured neural architecture. Even if they are sympathetic to the philosophers, the entire enterprise of neuroscience rests upon a scientific cultural infrastructure completely bound up with the assumptions of Cartesian dualism and reductive materialism. And since neuroscience actually makes money... Descartes and Newton ultimately rule the day in the minds of everyone outside the philosophy department. But such metaphysical assumptions left unquestioned in the mind of the serious contemplative can have highly stifling consequences. In the process of demonstrating this, I will attempt to kill two birds with one stone. While I have periodically referenced phenomenology as a branch of philosophy, we have not yet thoroughly immersed ourselves within it as a discipline. Still, I do not believe it to be necessary or even particularly helpful to go into its details as a historical academic phenomenon, 
For though one can study the phenomenologists and their ideas, the most important thing is to understand phenomenology not as a particular method of a particular philosopher, but as an attitude towards one's experience. As Heidegger himself neatly summarized, the comprehension of phenomenology consists in grasping it as possibility. So, to the end of recognizing the phenomenological reflective potential in all of our minds, I would like to take us through an exercise to demonstrate the limitations of our usually dominant realist prejudices. Consider the sight of some physical object in your vicinity. What is it exactly that you are paying attention to? You may answer in the form of a verbal name for the object, but is that really what it is? Of course not. A sound or a sequence of symbols cannot fully encapsulate the intricate detail of the object and, besides, the actual experiences of hearing or reading its name are completely different than the experience of seeing it. And yet, there is somehow a link being made. Whereas the sight of the object is there in all of its brilliant positivity, also included in the experience is a whole richness of possibility and context, none of which is fully actual like the object itself, yet nonetheless somehow still determines the reality of that actual. There is object, and there is ground. And I do not m simply mean the visual background. Although the orientation and position of the object in space surrounded by the vagueness of periphery is part of the object's ground, there is also an the entire space of comprehension surrounding, determining, and penetrating the experience of the object. Somehow, inexplicably, we know the object's name. Not only that, but we know that we are looking at the object for a reason. We know that we are following the instructions of an exercise. And yet, when we explicitly recall the object's name or think about why we're looking at the object, those positive experiences of recollection and thinking are actually completely different from the experience of seeing. When we return to the sight of the object, those other actualities of recollecting and thinking disappear. And yet, they are somehow still lurking. So, in the experience of seeing the object, it has become clear that there is simultaneously and necessarily both actuality and possibility. Object and ground. Positivity and context. A bifurcation of existence into what Sartre referred to as being and nothingness. Unless you are already familiar with such concepts, this may be the first time you have ever considered the imminent, constant context that pervades and encloses your experience of reality, because in our day-to-day -day experience of life, it is quite common that we often completely ignore the reality of nothingness, focusing entirely on the positivity of being. We take all the context about the world that our minds provide for us completely for granted, and even assume that context to be real and concrete in the same way that the objects we directly perceive are such that being completely occludes nothingness. We thereby imagined nothingness to be fake or 
imaginary. But nothing could be further from the case. Nothingness is real as such, but it is not equivalent to being. Our ability to rapidly move between one object of being to another, drawing each rapidly in succession out of the nothingness of temporality, intuition, context, and intentionality allows us to live safely in the illusion that nothingness is irrelevant, that nothingness does not exist. The problem is that ignoring nothingness is equivalent to ignoring the nature of reality. In conceiving all of our experiences to be emerging from a realm of pure positivity, from the realm of common sense everyday objects like tables and chairs or the scientific world of discrete mathematically predictable particles, we allow ourselves to forget the fact that all such conceptions of the real are themselves made out of experiences that invariably have both facticity and context and manifest entirely within the domain of the mind. We are often in the habit of viewing our lives as something that is happening to us, thinking that the world is coming at us from the outside. We attempt to take an objective view from nowhere and conceive our lives as if from the third person, when in reality every such third person view is something that must always necessarily be thought up and experienced from the first person. The reason why this is a problem is that, by conceiving the entire universe as something completely external to us, we can thereby blame all of our problems on the happenings within that universe and totally ignore the domain of the mind. This draws us towards one end of a spectrum of attitudes that Sartre referred to as bad faith. On one end of the bad faith spectrum, we only affirm and identify ourselves with being. In this form of bad faith, we conceive ourselves to exist as an object in the world with a static essence and purpose, denying to ourselves that our identity is ultimately built out of our choices to live and behave in certain ways. Choices that could, at any moment, be unmade. The chosen possible we do not wish to see as sustained in being by a pure, annihilating freedom. And so, we attempt to apprehend it as engendered by an object already constituted, which is no other than ourself, envisaged and described as if it were another person. On the other extreme of bad faith, there is the denial of facticity, the desire to disown the factual reality of being that cuts down possibility into the singleness of the situation that is. We wish here to identify with the transcendence of nothingness, with the total freedom of choice in our imaginings of what we could be if only we had the opportunity, denying the oppressive responsibility that calls out to us from the concrete now. Both forms of bad faith are not exactly equivalent to a lie, as Sartre was quick to point out. They are rather more of a willful or simply habitual ignorance of some aspect of our existential condition. I must here point out the parallel between Sartre's idea of bad faith as a means of avoiding some otherwise disquieting facts of life and the Buddhist doctrine that ignorance is the root of craving and therefore the root of suffering. 
Though he described some of the negative aspects of living in bad faith and encouraged his readers to fight against it in the pursuit of living as a more authentic, self-aware, and free individual, Sartre ultimately conceded that bad faith was an inevitable part of life. The Buddha was not so pessimistic, and one could accurately classify the Tamma as a systemic action plan for completely obliterating all vestiges of bad faith. But whatever its possibilities for elimination may be, we see here that in naive realist metaphysics there is a bit of bad faith lurking that will, if unrecognized, perpetually pull us in the direction of denying responsibility for our existential condition. When we're all atoms in a deterministic world or passive subjects determined by our social conditioning and immutable human nature, we diminish or even outright deny the role of volitional agency in shaping our lives. These higher-level metaphysical assumptions can then trickle down into a more intimate form of bad faith at the very immediate moment-to-moment -moment level where we, through the guiding light of our metaphysical assumptions, do not allow ourselves to recognize or even think to notice certain aspects of our experience at that most basic phenomenological level. This contextual trickle-down idea is key to a comprehensive understanding of the role that metaphysics plays in our lives and warrants more explicit formulation. We began this chapter describing metaphysics as the comprehensive context of our intellectual life and noting the crisis that has unfolded out of the recognition that such a context can never have any final, firm foundation. But as we explored in both the last chapter and in the last few paragraphs, metaphysics is not simply and exclusively an intellectual project. The context that our lives are lived within is a deeply emotional and spiritually charged matter that has penetrating, all-encompassing ramifications for every aspect of our being in the world. By being in the world, I am, of course, referring to that ground state existential condition that is the anxious, contextually grounded first person human existence, which Heidegger referred to as Dasein, or being there. Our highest theological ideas can and do have impacts on the subtlest movements of our attention, and vice versa. Context and purpose abound in Dasein at every level of analysis. In this way, every single one of our choices reinforce or subvert our ideals in a mutually reinforcing process. We can formalize this system characterized by complex, dynamic, continuously self-referential movement of context recontextualizing context by splitting metaphysics into two metaphysics as myth and metaphysics as mindfulness the myths we believe dictate what we hold to be true and valuable and guide our choices of how to spend our time and what to pay attention to what to be mindful of that which we are habitually mindful of and attentive to, as well as the ensuing choices we make, in turn, determine how we are interpreting our overarching mythical narrative, what aspects we emphasize and actualize, thereby morphing the texture and sometimes even the content of the myth in line with our on-the-ground strategy for avoiding suffering and attaining happiness. Though Buddhism, like every other religion, does have a mythological aspect to its metaphysics, it emphasizes the mindfulness aspect far more than any other system of thought that I have ever come across. 
Most other ideological or religious systems of belief emphasize myth, implicitly operating under the expectation that mindfulness will follow naturally after the light of the guiding ideal. We have already discussed in Chapter 1 how such an assumption is always going to be mistaken to some extent. Thus, the recognition of mindfulness as an absolutely crucial aspect of human life and spiritual development, with importance equal to or even surpassing that of myth, could be considered the Tama's most exceptional contribution to humanity as a whole. In the Satipatthana Sutta, the foundational text on mindfulness and perhaps one of the most important scriptures in the whole of the Buddhist canon, it is even stated explicitly by the Buddha that proper mindfulness is the direct path for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and distress, for the attainment of the right method, and for the realization of unbinding. In the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha details four frames of reference that we should use to guide our understanding and contemplations in a direction that will lead to the cessation of greed, aversion, and delusion, and thereby put an end to suffering. These frames of reference are almost maddeningly simple. The instructions are to contemplate and then, to the extent necessary for knowledge and remembrance, simply remain abiding in an authentic, dispassionate understanding of the body in and of itself, affective feelings in and of themselves, the mind in and of itself, and a particular list of significant mental qualities in and of themselves, all while remaining ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. The Satipatthana Sutta is not the only sutta in the Pali Canon. Sutta is the Pali word for scripture. And one could, as others have, spend a lifetime ferreting out the subtleties of these instructions as they relate to the Tama as a whole. But I want to emphasize the simplicity of these recommendations. When properly directed and pursued within a container of rigorous ascetic discipline, the Buddha is basically telling us that all we need to do in order to become enlightened is to consistently and continually remain contextually aware of the nature of existence as it is directly experienced, while simultaneously making the effort to remember to put aside the unwholesome contextual frameworks of greed, aversion, and distraction. Frameworks that, as we will discuss later, necessarily entail a compromise in the integrity of our mindfulness. Thus, by following along with the two phenomenological exercises that I have so far led us through, you have actually inadvertently taken a couple small steps towards enlightenment. The links between the Tamma and phenomenology are so strong that the contemplative methodology of the Tamma has been characterized by Tanisharo Piku as a form of radical phenomenology, a mode of perception that looks at experiences and processes simply as events, with no reference to the question of whether there are any things lying behind those events, or of whether the events can be really said to exist. This description points us to the very interesting metaphysical ramifications that the Tamma's heavy emphasis on radical phenomenology via mindfulness must have. By rooting ourselves in an awareness of phenomena as they are directly experienced, 
the ontological status of those phenomena and the mythos that we might interpret them by actually recede into the background. Indeed, when we are in the process of thinking about our lives and our world through the context of our governing mythos, an excellent application of mindfulness is to turn mindfulness onto those mythological thoughts themselves and understand them as an ongoing process of thinking that is contextualized by, for example, the inevitability of death. If we do this properly, we should be able to pick up on the kinds of dynamics that I discussed in chapter 1, the ways that we identify with and feed on our life's mythos, the specific narratives and images associated with that mythos, the triggers in the external environment that lead us to falling back on those thoughts as a defense mechanism, etc., None of that significance will carry the weight it usually does when mindfully compared to the precious condition we find ourselves in, totally dependent on incomprehensibly complex, fragile, and vulnerable little bags of meat. Its emphasis on mindfulness leads to the Tama being highly mythologically self-aware in comparison to other religions or even secular ideologies, the Buddha openly acknowledges that his teaching is a human fabrication, as in the Alagadu Pamasutta, where he compares his teaching to a raft that someone would use to cross a treacherous river, clinging closely to the raft, while still kicking and swimming to the other side, but then discarding it once arriving back on dry land. The penetration of a mindful, phenomenological approach into Buddhist metaphysics is so deep that, in several suttas, the Buddha defines the entire cosmos exclusively in terms of the six sense bases, that which is seen, heard, tasted, smelled, touched, and thought. In these ways and others, the Tamma distinguishes itself dramatically in its conception of the real, in comparison to almost all mainstream metaphysical worldviews and their natural image of thought, a classical conception of knowledge that presupposes the positions of truth and falsity within a world comprised of knowable, grounded empirical phenomena emanating from a necessary world. Like the slow process of blurring the line between realism and idealism that has taken place in Western philosophy since Kant, every metaphysical concept contained in the Buddhist worldview must be interpreted in light of its commitment to a radical phenomenology. Not only this, But in considering the Tama as a raft, we are encouraged to hold it within a pragmatic, utilitarian mindset as a means to the final end of liberation from suffering. For these reasons, I propose that every aspect of the Buddhist metaphysic should be viewed using three distinct lenses. First, there is the mythical, natural image that can be found abundantly portrayed in artwork across Asia, serving as the religious face of Buddhism presented to the rest of the world and held dear in the culture of Buddhists everywhere. Secondly, there is the metaphorical, allegorical, utilitarian image that takes the lessons and concepts presented in the mythos and implements them into everyday life. The metaphorical lens also functions in reverse, building and modifying intellectual and practical frameworks out of the patterns and feedback we recognize through our intimate engagement with life. If we take ontology in Heidegger's sense of the word, there is, thirdly, That image uniquely emphasized by the Tama, the phenomenological, structural, 
ontological image that necessarily serves as the experiential container for the other two images and is, ultimately, where the truth of the Buddha's teaching must be directly recognized for ourselves. These three interpretive lenses follow our bifurcation of metaphysics into myth and mindfulness, adding metaphor to designate that messy but necessary process of constant mediation between the other two images. This tripartite hermeneutic, let's call it the three M's, may serve as a solid basis for a meta-metaphysic, providing a useful framework for critically examining the patterns of our minds. If we agree with Emerson's suggestion that a man is what he thinks about all day long, the potential value of such a diagnostic project becomes apparent. Our assumptions serve as the geographical borders of our lives. If we are dissatisfied with the state of our mind, it might be time to emigrate. To demonstrate such exploratory value, I would like to use the three M's to examine the most central metaphysical concept of the Buddhist worldview, samsara. In this analysis, I will attempt to show the significant existential ramifications of such a cosmology thereby perhaps making such a myth more palatable to Western ears. This is as close to Buddhist apologetics as we are going to get in this book, a form of discourse I find to be incredibly distasteful as a whole, so it seems appropriate to just directly address the topic now and get it over with. We have shown so far that all explicit conceptions of the real are ultimately groundless. This is a foundational problem of metaphysics and was recognized as such by both Heidegger and Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein demonstrated just how deep the problem went, and Heidegger took the only other route possible by delving into Dasein in order to ascertain a fundamental ontology via phenomenology. By adjusting ourselves into a reflexive, mindful point of view, we can recognize the shape and character of the mythos we inhabit through repetitive habits of interpretation and intentional action based on those interpretations. When we do this, what we conceive to be real or not starts to take on a much more fluid character. The natural image of thought appears, in this attitude, to be not so much obsolete as simply limited. When it comes down to it, there is only Dasein. This experience, right here, this body, these thoughts, these emotions, this suffering. In the recognition of Dasein, an air of epistemological humility begins to rise as dogmatism evaporates. It is no betrayal of my metaphysical integrity to admit that I myself still habitually turn to a scientific materialist worldview to navigate certain situations. But when we do this, we should try to recognize that we are doing so and more and more attempt to refrain from using that view to distract ourselves from our perilous existential situation as a lump of flesh supported by a wholly hypothetical causal substrate that we can never truly have access to, understanding of, or control over. We should attempt to refrain from building an identity out of that view that will bring us into conflict with others, holding it more and more as one raft among others that we use to support ourselves just as we use food to support our bodies. In doing so, dogmatism can be recognized as just another strategy for avoiding suffering and not a very good one at that.
Not only does the mindful approach allow us to retain emotional distance from our views, but it also grants us the only authentic means by which to discern between them. Perpetual mindfulness of our liability to suffering. When all of your three M's begin to revolve entirely around obtaining a fuller understanding and effecting a more comprehensive elimination of suffering, everything you think or say or do becomes fully and most effectively pragmatic. Metaphysical views can then be held and used in just the same way as Heidegger's hammer. So long as this does not descend into a heedless contentment with what can only ever be a temporary local optimum of comfort opposed to a concerted, self-critical effort towards the global, permanent elimination of suffering, metaphysical pragmatism is an approach I highly recommend. So long as you take metaphor and allegory very, very seriously, you could easily interpret the entirety of the Tamma through an entirely allegorical lens, without losing anything of value whatsoever. Nevertheless, what I hope this chapter supports is the following recognition. That previous statement applies to every single worldview that anyone has ever had. When you become adept at recognizing your own thoughts as no more and no less real than any other experience you have and just as transient, what it even means for something to be real or just a story is a question that will have less and less applicability to your life. The real is entirely dictated by what you have habitually regarded as serious and real relative to those things to which you ascribe less personal significance, history, and relevance. I can very seriously and without a drop of exaggeration attest that what I personally have regarded as true and real has significantly changed multiple times over the course of my life. I promise that such changes could happen to you too if you were willing to entertain them. If you take a metaphor seriously, it will eventually stop being just a metaphor. The only reason the real is capable of being upheld as a singular static thing is because most people live and die having only lived under the matrix of a single, relatively unified and dogmatic ideological structure. Money, science, and rule of law are all just stories, but they are also all very real. When all conceptions of the real are seen to be myths, all myths must be equally recognized as deeply impactful aspects of life that cannot simply be dismissed or ignored. The myths of our lives must be addressed with the utmost care and deliberation. So, with our apologetics at an end, let us take some care with samsara then, shall we? Buddhist samsara is a conception of the world that is uniquely dynamic among most traditional religious cosmologies. There are a large number of hierarchical heavens and hells in samsara, yet the inhabitants within all of them are only ever guests there for a single lifetime before they move on to another plane of existence according to their karma. Gods like Indra and Brahma make appearances from Hindu mythology, but in the Buddhist samsara, even the most powerful gods are still mortal. They can be exceptionally powerful and may even think themselves to be the creator of the universe because of how long they have been alive, 
but their incredible privilege and pleasure have only a finite duration before they must inevitably relinquish their post. When death has come and their time is up, they must hand off their title to some other fortunate replacement as they are thrown by their karma into a different cosmological cubicle, almost invariably being pulled down to a lower rung on the cosmic food chain. So already we have a bit of unease baked into our samsaric being, the anxiety of a limited lifespan, an unknown subsequent destination. But the insecurity doesn't stop there. Samsara is a place whose size and scope in both time and space are unfathomable and not in such a way that we could even conceive it to be eternal or infinite. In a display of remarkable doctrinal restraint, the Buddha, in many discourses, delineates the scope of samsara as simply inconceivable. Though this is a bit of a digression, I mention the Buddha's metaphysical quietism because it lends credence to our embrace of a fully pragmatic epistemology. When asked about such things as the beginning and the end of the world or the existence of the soul, the Buddha would often respond to the effect of, your assumptions surrounding such inquiry are deluded, and even if you had got an answer to your question, you would be no better off than before you asked it. I teach suffering and the end of suffering And that is the topic you should be attending to and spending your time on. What scant metaphysical discourse the Buddha did provide to his disciples is always highly supportive of this existential focus. Samsara is characterized as a realm of a vast time and space where beings transmigrate from life to life following a trajectory determined by the character of their craving and the kind of mental state that craving habitually engenders, the word samsara can be accurately and evocatively translated as the great wandering on. The Buddhist cosmos is a universe lacking in any permanent safety, where the highest of highs must inevitably be taken along with the lowest of lows. No identity is stable or permanent. Every other being in the universe has at one time in the past been your mother, father, daughter, and son. The tears we have shed over our dead children and the blood we have spilled in violent conflict are said to be greater in volume than the entire ocean. Long have you thus experienced stress, experienced pain, experienced loss, swelling the cemeteries, enough to become disenchanted with all fabricated things, enough to become dispassionate, enough to be released. In a far more profound manner than my anti indulgent discourse of chapter one, the Buddha expounded the futility of sensual existence by sowing that reality right into the fabric of the universe. In the dialectic between the immediate phenomenological analysis of the futility of pleasure and its cosmological instantiation, we have what is, to my eye, one of the most beautiful aspects of the Tama, its scale invariance. I must credit Tanisaro Piku here for this idea that the Buddhist treatment of causality through such concepts as karma or paticca samuppada can and should be interpreted as a generalized fractal pattern that obtains within the movements of moment-to-moment attention up into the micro-births and deaths we experience moving through different stages of life all the way to the most astronomical of timescales. 
This scale invariance idea lends itself quite neatly to the process of ontological softening that authentically grappling with metaphysics naturally leads to. As with any other cyclical or fractal representations of being, samsara is quite rich with regard to archetypal or mystic imagery, as can be clearly recognized in its ubiquity within New Age spirituality and most other alternatives to monotheism. Samsara is an idea deeply rooted in the human experience beyond its direct historical and cultural sway. What is the multiverse trope in so much of contemporary fiction if not a demonstration of how the great wheel of birth and death is an idea that is itself repeated again and again in artistic projects both profound and banal? I do not here mean to justify Buddhist mythology exclusively through some kind of perennial appeal. In fact, I consider perennialism as a whole to be intellectually useless in its conciliatory impotence, and it will have even more criticism than that coming its way in a later chapter. The Buddha taught in many ways how perennial attitudes and assumptions are often radically mistaken, and attempting to justify the tamma via any external grounds at all is an apologetic fool's errand. Rather, explanation and internal justification is the extent of our ambitions here. I would simply like to point out that the idea of samsara is not as exotic as it might appear. Beyond its more popular examples, many philosophers have been jumping into the mix of samsaric chaos for over a century now. Nietzsche had his crucible of the will in imagining the eternal repetition of this same life again and again. Heidegger recognized that it is essential to the basic constitution of Dasein that there is constantly something still to be settled. And then, there is the entirety of postmodernity leading to a contemporary philosopher like Brazier calling nihilism the process of universal unbinding through which the twin vectors of science and capital together expose unbound multiplicity as the veritable figure of being. Samsara appears to be everywhere, and that is exactly the point of the idea a fully comprehensive existential interpretation of samsara is thus very easy to construct. All that we must do is take the idea of samsara as a fractal pattern repeating across time scales and extend it up and out from the purely historical horizontal axis into the vertical axis of Transtemporal phenomenological structure and ontology. Using Heidegger's sense of the words, we obtain samsara as existential condition by expanding it into the domain of temporality, going beyond mere historicity. Samsara is the fact that Dasein is the only thing. You have ever known, and the only thing you can ever know. For to conceive of something external to Dasein would necessarily be yet another experience of Dasein. Samsara's heavens and hells show themselves in the now through your liability to imagine and experience incredible pleasure and equal levels of pain. Beginningless samsara is there in your inability to form a coherent conception of your birth. We may imagine ourselves having floated in a sea of blackness for the eternity before we were born, but that is a fanciful placeholder for the horror of inconceivable non-existence. 
That is not to say that you ever were non-existent. Such a thing would be, again, inconceivable. Did Dasein ever truly start? Will it ever end? You cannot know. Dasein is all there is, and all there ever can be. For if it were not Dasein, it would not be. From the first-person perspective, consciousness does not ever truly cease. It only waxes and wanes. The difference between birth and death is only a relative designation. Samsara is this, right now. And right now, there is thrownness. You know not how it came to be, yet here you are in this form, thrown into life, alone and vulnerable. You care about all this, and you cannot stop caring, but this fleshy sack does not seem to care that you care. It keeps getting sick and getting old. We build mental artifices to ignore these realities, because by ignoring thrownness, we may conceive ourselves to be in a world that is safe and secure. As Heidegger puts it, in the face of its thrownness, Dasein flees to the relief which comes with the supposed freedom of the they self. Yet, such freedom is only ever supposed, for eventually the tides must come in and destroy the sandcastle into which we have fled. Every mythological variety of what the Buddha called wrong view is defined as such for the universal quality of being built on a foundation of bad faith and anxiety. Wrong views are wrong because the more we wrap ourselves in narratives of security, the more vulnerable we become when the comfort blanket is inevitably wrenched from our grip. Samsara is your existential condition, whether you like it or not. On and on and on. There is significance here in Dasein rich context and meaning, such significance that it is indeed inescapable. Recognizing as much is one of phenomenology's most important insights. Heidegger even discerned that care is baked right into the fabric of time itself. If we extrapolate from that, take a cosmological step back and survey existence with a discerning eye, we will inevitably recognize a sobering reality. The insignificance of significance. Love and hate are just more experiences. There's red, now blue. There will always be another family member, another sexual partner, another quest to complete. Here it is again, yet another meaningful experience that came from and goes to whence I do not know. Meaning is itself meaningless. There is only wandering on, funneled by nothingness into yet another being. And when will it ever be enough? Heidegger boldly declares, the urge to live is not to be annihilated. The addiction to becoming lived by the world is not to be rooted out. Are we Westerners to remain, like our archetype Faust, willing to burn for an eternity so that we might continue to say to the moment flying, Linger a while, thou art so fair. But the moment never lingers. The only way out, to put it simply, is to abandon meaning and to abide in thrownness. 
This is much easier said than done because the craving that keeps us bound up and identified with the never-ending flux of samsaric meaning is as ephemeral as time, yet it's just as close, just as intimate. It requires intensive mindfulness, a context of intention that is laser-focused on recognizing craving so that we can begin to stop actively feeding it. The usual context of our minds, the usual context of our world, is defined by sensuality and all those supporting narratives we tell ourselves in order to continually justify trying to suck the marrow out of meaning rather than recognizing it for the dry bone that it is. We do not suggest abandoning meaning by destroying it in some misotheistic fit of rage. Meaning cannot be eradicated, and besides, Nietzsche already did most of the smashing for us with his hammer-like prose. So long as there is Dasein, there will be care. The end of care would be a sterile existence of timeless, pure positivity akin to the platonic forms, insofar as we can imagine such a thing at all, because care always already is, ending care is impossible regardless. We can abandon meaning only by disowning care, by seeing it as something perpetually already given which we cannot be responsible for, except by our own deluded taking of that responsibility. Indeed, it is that taking that is our only true responsibility, a negative responsibility that we can heed only through renunciation. When we begin to put down the world, we are starting a journey in the direction of that only lasting source of happiness, peace. We discussed in Chapter 1 the usual means of acquiring happiness through gratification and the necessary pain that comes simultaneously with the pleasure of the chase. Peace is that which we can discern in an impure but nevertheless genuine way after we have exhausted ourselves by pounding empty pleasure into our minds for long enough that we can consider our craving as having been sated. The contentment we feel afterwards in the relinquishment of a craving satisfied should give us a clue to the true happiness that we seek. Even when we are mired in craving, we still always know that what is most enjoyable is to no longer crave. Beyond physically restraining ourselves from the framework of sensuality through celibacy and other forms of asceticism, the way to then go beyond restraint and uproot craving at the source is to become comfortable with the existential situation that we use our cravings to ignore or even outright deny. We must learn to not flee in the face of the reality where we find ourselves being continually bombarded by being. A being that we cannot ultimately fathom or control, but for which we are nonetheless responsible, and bound up. We must learn to abide in throneness. Such an abiding requires the capacity to stand up in immovable indifference to samsara, which means we must gain an understanding of what it means to be moved. There are many facets to this recognition, but that which is most pertinent to our exploration of Buddhist metaphysics, is the nothingness of craving. 
We have already briefly discussed Sartre's idea of nothingness as that aspect of Tassin that is not and cannot be present, as in the positivity of being, yet still pervades and follows along with experience like a shadow. In being and nothingness, Sartre gives the example of us waiting in a café for Pierre. While we are waiting, Pierre is factually not in the café. The café is all that there positively is, yet Pierre's absence completely dominates and colors our entire experience of the café. We are haunted by nothingness, by that which we are mindful of. The entire orientation of being is always wholly determined by that which is not. I have found it evocative and helpful in my own life to refer to this aspect of Tassin as the shape of the mind. Coming to an understanding of the shape of your own mind, the citta nimitta, as it is referred to in the Pali Canon, is so fundamental to the Tama that in the Sanghanikarama Sutta, it is listed as a hard requirement for awakening. What makes the Tama deep, hard to see, hard to realize, and subtle as it is sometimes described in the suttas, is this fact that the shape of our mind is not and never can be right in front of our eyes, so to speak. It cannot even be directly controlled or manipulated. Only directly understood and indirectly guided towards an ideal state of relaxation and unbinding. Though this may seem completely incomprehensible at first, there are actually a variety of other such phenomena that can only ever be discerned indirectly, understood, but not seen. For example, time is not something that can ever truly be the focus of our attention, except in our abstract conceptualizations about time. We can recall the past and watch a clock, but in none of those experiences can we ever truly find time, because temporality is not there as a positive experience, but is rather a fundamental ontological basis for our ability to find anything. Yet, time exists, as does the shape of the mind. Nothingness exists as such. And it is within this domain of nothingness that all of the most important phenomena regarding suffering and the end of suffering reside. For example, it is stated in the Chulavidhala Sutta that, just like time, Clinging is not identical to the five aggregates, the Buddhist doctrinal equivalent to Heidegger's Dasein, but that clinging also cannot be discerned apart from the five aggregates. Clinging and craving exert pressure upon the mind indeed, and they can obviously be felt as painful. But what is it really that is painful? There can be all the arising thoughts and images of that which we desire and do not have, but those are just passing thoughts that are gone as quickly as they came. The tukha is there not in the thoughts themselves, but in the pressure to act that forms the context of those thoughts, constricting the shape of our mind into the shape of sensuality, just as Pierre's absence reshapes the café. This, right here, 
is the absolutely crucial recognition in the quest to resolve nihilism. When we begin to understand the shape and patterns of the mind in such a way that we can directly recognize craving, as well as its attendant suffering and the constriction of our mind's shape into the form and the mythos of sensuality, we then have the power to leverage our established context of mindfulness to either explicitly reject or, when the existential knowledge and remembrance of proper mindfulness has been drilled in deep enough, even completely undermine the very possibility for the encroachment of that mythos, allowing us to abide in our chosen mythos of resolute contentment and enduring peace. For the mythos of sensuality is always a story that shamelessly denies the reality of throneness and the groundless codependence of being on nothingness and nothingness on being. The desire for intellectual security is always an emotional narrative wherein we do not know enough, where we are bewildered and confused and looking for a way out of our perpetual condition of ethical ambiguity, epistemological groundlessness, and existential vulnerability. Craving lures us into bad faith and into a contextual realm in which some fictitious safe solidity is substituted for the airy intangibility of Dasein. By ignoring the primordial unownability of experience, we conceive of a static, independently existing world outside our senses, not recognizing that such a conception is invariably based upon particular experiences of particular thoughts and the underlying contextual attitudes that drive and motivate those thoughts. Seeing the bait of solidity for what it is and defiantly learning how to cultivate the context of contentment, how to be independent of conceptual certainty, and how to abide comfortably with thrownness is the only means there is from finally making peace with the absurdity of samsara and letting go of the desire for intellectual security. This is the way to the resolution of nihilism. Now, there is a danger here that some astute readers may have already noticed. By discussing all of this in concrete terms and fabricating a phenomenological myth of renunciation, we are in danger of succumbing to exactly the same illusions of solidity that we are attempting to avoid. In discussing such concepts as Dasein, the five aggregates, being, nothingness, or thrownness, there is always the possibility of making them into things, a process known as reification. Things that only ever have a nominal relationship to that which they are. Conceptual knowledge can start to stand in for understanding. This is a perpetual danger for the whole of the phenomenological enterprise and one that, I am sorry to say, the vast majority of Buddhist scholastics have fallen prey to over the millennia. This tendency, I think, is some small part of what prevented the existentialists from recognizing those insights that the Buddha expounded and was almost certainly a fatal stumbling block for many Buddhist practitioners throughout history. The project of phenomenology often ignores the reality of thrownness as it applies to the phenomenological project itself. Of course, we could attempt to 
recognize that and then engage in phenomenological theorization about phenomenological theorization as it relates to an assumed conceptualized notion of thrownness, which is itself just another unownable thrown intellectual experience. This process can continue to occur ad infinitum and always retains some measure of bad faith, subtle clinging, and misconceiving. Therefore, we return to the wisdom of the Buddha's metaphysical quietism. All that can truly be done in response to this danger is to remain perpetually vigilant regarding the feeling of security that we draw from our knowledge of the Tama and to repeatedly, incessantly question the extent to which our contentment is due to real understanding or is born merely out of an intellectualized complacency. Once the shape of the mind is recognized and the nature of suffering is directly discerned, it actually becomes quite a simple thing to avoid the trap of holding on to our views without needing to go to the extreme of trying to stop thinking entirely. So long as they are seen with clarity, conceptualizations about the mind itself can be incorporated into the mindful context we continue to maintain, even in a completely circular, self-referential way. Reflexive reflection can always be applied to discursive reflection. Authentic reflection and conceptual discourse expounding on our understanding can, when done appropriately, actually be an excellent tool for probing just how deep that understanding truly is. It always comes down to directly recognizing for yourself the shape of the mind and the tension and avoidance that emerges out of willful ignorance. If you're self-transparent enough, you'll be able to recognize when you're using all of your book learning to imagine yourself to be a lot more enlightened than you actually are. We must keep thrusting the Tama mythos down, down into a perpetual mindfulness whose sensitivity continues to be built up and tuned more and more into the frequency of Tukha and all the attendant ontological distortions and delusions that support and maintain it. Our mindfulness can then simultaneously and symbiotically re-evaluate the mythos we have formed, ensuring it remains faithful to what we are actually experiencing and preventing it from becoming pathologically self-referential and self-satisfied. Through this relentless self-honesty, you can begin to recognize what it means to grasp at views, a habit the Buddha frequently described as a fetter. By transmuting myth into mindfulness, myth itself begins to be seen as a hollow shell, useful like a raft, but unnecessary when the lessons have been learned, the context internalized, and, ideally, brought to consummation. Yet the raft still exists and retains its utility for those who need it. Indeed, the Buddha's whole post-awakening career involved throwing life preservers to those who had little dust in their eyes instantiating and shoring up the doctrine such that it remains available for us to use some 2,600 years later. These concepts are incredibly useful, and to that extent, they are incredibly true. To find truth that goes beyond usefulness, you'll have to put them into practice and see for yourself. Thus, 
we have what I previously referred to as the totalized, pragmatic weaponization of metaphysics against suffering. It is in this weaponization and its ensuing reorganization of our entire emotional constitution that we can resolve the nihilistic paradox identified by Nietzsche. As he wrote, this in vain is the nihilist's pathos and inconsistency on the part of the nihilists. The in vain of Samguega is indeed where we must begin, but eventually the hold such a pathos has on our minds begins to fade. In vain must always arise within a context of desire for a higher purpose, a yearning for a preordained place among the stars. Such a natural human longing is, like so many others, simply abandoned along the Buddhist path as just another source of suffering. The teleological mindset such an emotion must emerge out of is seen as another bait, another perturbation, another empty myth whose weight is simply not worth the effort. All such effort is already focused on only those avenues we can see directly contributing to a lasting, imperturbable happiness. As I said before, I am not interested in or even capable of justifying the Tama in any fundamental, final way. There is no way to justify the pursuit of putting a final end to suffering. The Buddha never even tried to justify such a thing. Either you believe such a project is worthy of your time, or you do not. It, like any other speculative enterprise, inevitably just requires a bit of faith going in. I only hope that through thorough explanation, I can convince those who would be so inclined to perhaps give it a shot. I am writing the book that I wish I had been given as an immediate follow-up to reading Nietzsche as a teenager. We have so many presuppositions in our culture today that would like to convince us that awakening is impossible, or naive, or even undesirable, escapist, and weak, that faith in such a thing is based in superstitious nonsense, that putting our head down, breeding some taxpayers, and toiling away for our tribe is the only kind of life that is worth living. To put the catchphrase of philosopher Slavoj Žižek to good use, I would prefer not to. Žižek has been looking for the third pill, the alternative to the red and the blue, and I tell you, here it is. If you will follow me into the forest, I and the other disciples of the Buddha will show you how to take it. Chapter 3 The Ethics of Ascetics A person impassioned, his mind bound up, overcome with passion, doesn't discern as it has come to be what is of profit to himself, what is of profit to others, what is of profit to both. But, having abandoned passion, he discerns as it has come to be what is of profit to himself, what is of profit to others, what is of profit to both. Passion, my friend, makes you blind, makes you sightless, makes you ignorant. It brings about the cessation of discernment, is conducive to trouble, and does not lead to unbinding. Anguttara Nikaya 3.72 Buddhist ethics was the first topic I explored when I was just starting to investigate Buddhism. I had already gotten an inkling that there 
might be something to this whole meditation thing, and so a combination of intellectual integrity and raw burning some vuega forced me to explore the kinds of religious beliefs I would have previously written off as, well, as a bunch of bullshit, frankly. I was hoping to find some kind of deeper justification for the ethical precepts found in Buddhism, but during my initial cursory investigation, I came up as disappointed as with every other ethical system I had ever approached. Ethical nihilism is just one more skeptical phenomenon that mainstream Buddhist discourse is not prepared to speak to. So, before I even began writing this book, I knew I wanted to give ethics a thorough treatment to make up for this lack. For that reason, during my preparatory research, I took a brief detour into the realm of meta-ethics. Being an amateur philosopher, I had assumed, based on the name, that meta-ethics would be filled with discourse about how to choose between different ethical frameworks, the advantages or disadvantages of each, and the meta-frameworks we could construct for judging and choosing between them. What I found instead was a community of analytic philosophers floating around in an ocean of words, tossing between themselves the linguistic flotsam and jetsam of an ethical vessel that Wittgenstein had blown to smithereens. Such a characterization is obviously a bit uncharitable, but I don't think any such philosophers would deny that their work has little, if any, relationship to ethics and morality as these are actually wrestled with by every human being on a day-to-day -day basis. And yet, even all the other more down-to-earth ethical disciplines like normative, applied, and descriptive ethics are, out of their lack of resistance to egoism or skepticism, equally useless. The existentialists, thankfully, do a bit better by following Kierkegaard in forcing us to reckon with the fact that, in choosing a set of values to live our life by, we are ultimately met with an utterly criterionless choice. Though I do not agree that any choice is truly criterionless, the existentialists thus at least retain that pivotal connection to the primordial anguish of choice in all its ungroundable agony. But in practice, even the existentialists still go astray. To demonstrate, we may point to Sartre's idealistic notion of ethics as expressed in Existentialism is a Humanism. Sartre's criticism of those who act contrary to Kant's categorical imperative, the rationalistic golden rule not to do anything that couldn't be made in a universal law, is indicative of his unwillingness to entertain nihilism's icy presence in his mind. As he writes, The man who lies in self-excuse by saying, everyone will not do it, must be ill at ease in his conscience, for the act of lying implies the universal value which it denies. The must is telling, because Sartre seems to suggest that there are absolute values after all. I must admit, whenever I read any ethics, I often have to fight old habits and restrain myself from bursting into laughter. Perhaps Sartre had simply never encountered a real beast like Don Corleone or the nihilist whom I myself was at one time. For such a man saying, everyone will not do it, is not the self-deceptive lie of a weak-willed moralist. Rather, it is the triumphant snarl of a disdainful predator. 
The pathetic ineffectiveness of every ethicist's scribblings is made deafeningly apparent in the moment when some arbitrary brigand stabs the scribbler in the heart and uses such scribblings as toilet paper. There have been many warlords and slave masters throughout history that lived long, enjoyable lives dining on the fruits produced by a human meat grinder churning beneath them, without a moment of ethical self-deception or hypocrisy. Upon being presented with such a facile idea as universal human values, they would have spat in Kant's face and told him to get back to the ledgers. Even today, in actual practice, human rights always only go so far as is convenient for geopolitical maneuvering, the efficient extraction of natural resources, and exploitation of human capital. There might not be as many brigands in the modern world, but a politician's or banker's utter indifference to the intelligentsia's pleading for a more egalitarian world has much the same effect. Slavery with extra steps. The possibility of such a disdainful, egotistical, cold-blooded approach to life as I have just described is so unthinkable for the vast majority of people that it is no wonder that the psychopath problem is so infrequently recognized as a major ethical problem. Any ethics that will ever be worth anything at all must be completely resistant to egoism, even to outright solipsism. For it is so often the case that those who are most driven and skilled at acquiring and maintaining power are also those who have the greatest ambivalence to petty morality. That so many ideas about good behavior can completely collapse under the question of what if I just don't care about other people is a deep indictment of their fundamental wisdom. All ethical systems with Abrahamic influence ultimately fall because of this Achilles heel. As soon as you stop believing in the myth, the ethical structure also goes right out the window. The ancient Greeks focus on eudaimonia as a long-term state of well-being resulting from virtuous character and good living is certainly a lot better and might restrain the worst impulses of otherwise vicious or indulgent actors, but it's still not really enough. Without any deeper grounding, virtue will always be a relative thing, effectively equivalent to the way the average person lives. At best, it will remain the moving average of each individual's idealized notion of what virtue is kept floating up in a fuzzy cloud of cultural narratives, hero worship, and repetitive platitudes. No, to turn a serial killer into a peaceful monk like the Buddha did with Ankulimala, a name that literally translates to finger necklace, you're going to need to bring out the big guns. Unfortunately for us, though, the big guns of Buddhism are, for the most part, buried under 2,600 years' worth of dust. If you just do a bit of cursory research into Buddhist ethics as I initially did, you will find numbered lists of do's and don'ts, like the five precepts and the noble eightfold path. It all sounded pretty much the same as any other system of religious ethics and thus received from me the same preliminary label, dogmatic and immature. I was looking for a good reason that I should not lie, not some pronouncements from a beatified dead guy. And though they might not put it so bluntly or even explicitly think in such terms, it seems that this skeptical sentiment I have expressed here is not unique 
for evidence of its influence abounds in the popular praxis of Western Buddhism. Virtue, or sila in the Pali, is often relegated to a wholly subsidiary or even supplementary role in Western Buddhism and, to greater or lesser degrees, is even given the back seat in some forms of traditional Asian Buddhism. Although there is universally at least some emphasis placed on maintaining mindfulness and a context of kindness and ease in daily life, virtue or ethics in the more classical sense is often entirely ignored by Western Buddhist teachers or given merely cursory treatment. While most avoid a total embrace of antinomianism, certain expressions of Buddhism can so heavily emphasize a metaphysics of emptiness and the illusoriness of all conditioned reality that they do indeed begin to succumb to perennial accusations of Buddhism being just a sophisticated form of nihilism. This ontological nihilism inevitably bleeds into ethical nihilism, leading to the falling away of any principled ethical stance whatsoever, such as what we can find in the work of a teacher like D.T. Suzuki, who wrote that Japanese Zen Buddhism is compatible with almost any moral doctrine, as long as its intuitive teaching is not interfered with. It is difficult to address this kind of issue without skirting into the territory of polemics. We have performed an analysis of sensuality and expounded a metaphysical interpretation of the Tama that may step on the toes of those that retain a relatively rigid, dogmatic, realist image of the Buddha's teaching, but would, I think, be relatively well-received or at least tolerated in every branch of Buddhism with which I am familiar. But, having laid the foundation, we will now be moving out of the realm of theory into that of practice. And it is here that the diversity of the Buddhist world makes itself known. Practice is the sand where lines must be drawn. Like many Westerners, my first interaction with Buddhism was framed by a narrow focus on meditative concentration exercises that were in some vague way imagined to eventually lead to emotional catharsis, spontaneous insights into the nature of reality, and eventually to a kind of sustained non-dual awareness that would constitute enlightenment. I can confirm through personal experience that if pursued with enough intensity, attempting to sit completely still with attention laser-focused on the sensations at the tip of your nostrils or the movement of energy just below the navel for hours on end can indeed lead to exactly those emotional catharses, mystical visions, and non-dual experiences that you may be looking for. But, unfortunately, none of those things have anything at all to do with what the Buddha taught. As we have previously discussed, craving and the end of craving, thus awakening, has far more to do with things like the structural, intentional framing of your experience, the context and motivations of your actions, and the emotional passion and connection you maintain with your senses through the manner by which you conceive your world. Whatever specific phenomena you might be able to perceive via your sense organs at any given time are, in the final analysis, irrelevant. To use Heidegger's terminology, the vast majority of meditation techniques focus so intently on the ontic that they ignore the ontological. Or, in Sartre's words, they totally emphasize being at the expense of nothingness.
This can lead to widespread, culturally reinforced misunderstandings of the nature of Tassain within even the most serious of meditation circles. These misunderstandings can often be most easily unveiled through questioning the structural patterns of language that the techniques are couched within. For example, critically examining such cliches as the instruction to stay in the present moment, as if it were ever possible to not be in the present moment. Even leaving aside any criticisms we might proffer to undermine the rational justification or conceptual coherency of the techniques themselves, if we are to keep faith with what the Buddha had to say about training towards awakening, then putting meditation first is wrong from the very start, for that is the exact opposite of the approach we find in the early texts. The Buddha frequently expounded a successive list of steps that should be taken by any of his disciples in the course of their training towards awakening, aptly named the Gradual Training. While this list was in some discourses abbreviated or expanded depending on the context, there is an invariable consistency to the order of the trainings as well as the simple overarching hint that there were certain trainings that the Buddha considered more foundational that should be focused on first before moving on to the latter trainings that require the previous as support and are, in truth, simply the natural maturation of those fundamentals. Whether or not meditation, as it is commonly understood in the modern world, could even be considered equivalent to any of the steps along the path is actually a crucial topic of ongoing research in early Buddhist studies. I have personally come to the relatively radical position that basically every commonly taught meditative focusing or concentration technique is unhelpful if not entirely counterproductive towards the training described in the early texts. Even if we leave that aside, the step along the path of the gradual training that is commonly understood to be equivalent to attaining rarefied states of intense concentration is actually one of the very last usually placed just before attaining the liberative insights that constitute awakening. The very first step is actually to reflect upon the fact that a normal lifestyle is unsuitable to the practice of the holy life and then accordingly go forth from the lay life to homelessness. Even if that's not an option that's on the table, the next step is to live according to a comprehensive set of disciplinary rules that include a prohibition on sexual activity of any kind, as well as bans on consuming entertainment, engaging in dancing or singing, and on drinking alcohol. And this is all, of course, in addition to the standard ethical principles of religions everywhere, like refraining from killing, stealing, or lying. Even moving past what can, at first glance, seem like an onerous collection of rules, the next step is to mindfully restrain the senses by not giving inappropriate attention to enticing sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, or thoughts that might inspire greed or aversion always maintaining a context of dispassion towards everything we come across. This is then followed by being moderate in eating, devoting the mind to wakefulness by not indulging in indolence or excessive sleep, all while maintaining constant situational awareness and mindfulness of one's body. 
What is being recommended here is an incredibly rigorous ethical, ascetic, and disciplinary training that should be mastered and made into one's preferred mode of living prior to any mention of meditation at all. While it can all seem incredibly overbearing at first, this should at least give us reason to pause and recognize that the Buddha took sila very seriously and considered it to be the foundation of awakening and, therefore, of happiness. I understand if this all seems to be the exact opposite of what happiness should entail, but maybe if I describe it in slightly different terms, it will start to become clearer. What the Buddha is encouraging us to do is to train in composure. It takes composure to not go chasing after every momentary whim, to retain constant self-awareness and live content within a lifestyle that is quite dry with respect to comfort and pleasure. But if we conceive of awakening as a perfect, imperturbable state of composure, then the connection becomes obvious. Let's keep pulling on this thread and dig a bit deeper to see if we can't make the relationship even more clear. To begin, we can even set aside the ascetic practices and focus on the way that a baseline level of ethical conduct contributes to composure and happiness. When I started the process of digging deeper into sila myself, I realized, to my astonishment, that the tama was actually giving me really, really good reasons why I, for example, shouldn't lie. I was being given reasons that were entirely for my own immediate recognizable benefit, reasons that had absolutely nothing to do with divine mandates, social duty, or even utilitarian game-theoretic justifications like reciprocal altruism. No, lying was described as being wrong because it inculcates an indifference to the truth, a laissez-faire attitude to reality that, after harming others, inevitably begins to directly harm yourself. I'd like to continue with this example of lying as a case study for the remarkable level of wisdom contained in the reasoning behind the Tama's ethics. An attitude that the truth is your plaything can be a very subtle temptress. Once you've gotten into the habit, it's only a matter of time before you start lying to yourself. You become more comfortable with being a hypocrite, with shrugging off the ramifications of your actions and blaming your problems on others when, deep down, you know that you are responsible, or would know if you only allowed yourself to. It starts to destroy your ability to hold yourself accountable and course correct when you make obvious mistakes, compounding the damage you are likely already causing yourself through other unskillful behaviors. Deepening in the habit of lying, bad faith will eventually come to characterize every moment of your life, and the severity of the disconnect between you and the truth will only grow with time as the garbage you'd rather ignore begins to pile up in the corner of your mind. You may try to keep your lies entirely compartmentalized into your interactions with others, but as you play the world, you begin to play yourself. Lying conditions not only ignorance, but also the kind of disposition that always needs to manage the optics of everything. The deceiver and the secret keeper may think themselves powerful. In that power, however, 
They are a slave to a mass of fake relationships they build their lives upon, a foundation ready to crumble at a moment's notice. It's a pathetic, ignoble, needy way to live. In a way, lying might even be the worst sin of all because it is so directly tied to bad faith and it is exactly a whole truckload of bad faith that is required for someone to do such a thing as, for instance, become a guard at Auschwitz. The ethics of the Tama are consequentialist, but in a far more nuanced and profound way than any coarse notion of utility maximization the direct material results of actions are actually far less important than the kinds of intentions, attitudes, and mental states that drive and are reciprocally driven by those actions. This conception of ethics is a natural result of Buddhist cosmology and any other similar metaphysics of disenchantment. Ultimately, the particular material circumstances of your life are unstable, impermanent, and, in the final analysis, irrelevant to the kind of happiness that is the wisest goal of life. Peace. Stealing is indeed wrong in a conventional sense because you are depriving someone else of their property but they were eventually going to lose that property regardless. At the very least, no one takes anything with them beyond the grave. It's the same thing with killing. No one gets out alive anyway. No, the most significant thing that you are stealing or killing is your own peace of mind. Through theft, you are cultivating and reinforcing a mind that is so insatiable that it is willing to risk all the consequences of the theft being discovered in order to obtain what you crave. And the same goes for murder. This is the immutable law of karma that can be recognized directly in the here and now. The habits you build out of your attitudes and behavior form the shape of your mind, and thus, the shape of your entire world. A thief or a murderer is not a contented, happy person. I understand that for those who haven't totally bought into the whole rebirth idea, emphasizing the immediate negative impacts of a murder on the mind of the killer as the most significant impact of the action compared to the tragedy inflicted on the loved ones of the victim may seem a bit callous. But, to be fair, this is not an ethical perspective unique to Buddhism. I actually can't think of a single traditional religious cosmology wherein the weight of the externalities of a person's actions come even close to the weight of consequence for transgressing against God's will, for example. The difference is that through the Tamma's emphasis on minimizing suffering in the here and now as well as in the future, and on the relationship that present actions maintain with future ethical tendencies, a murder can be recognized as unethical in a far more multifaceted way than simply as a transgression of divine law or a breach of the social contract. From the perspective of the Tama, if more for your own good than anything else, when someone intentionally harms you, the best response is actually to feel compassion for them because beyond compassion being good for you, such compassion is actually quite appropriate to the reality of the situation. That reality is such that your transgressor is, in a very direct and concrete way, 
digging themselves into a hole of self-inflicted suffering that will take a long time and a lot of effort to get out of. They only have so much power they can exert over you, but a hateful, petty, ignorant person must live with themselves and all the dysfunction and strife they carry along with them 24-7. With some rare exceptions, unvirtuous people usually end up hurting themselves far more than anyone else. If you believe in rebirth or an afterlife, there are no exceptions to the rule at all. Vengeance or retribution are not attitudes that help anyone, least of all the victims who might feel pulled towards such emotions. Hatred, like all sensuality, always has only a thin coat of pleasure wrapped around a much more sizable core of pain. Carrying on the same kind of hateful, unpleasant, and ignoble emotions and impulses that motivated whatever harm came to you is only giving the other person even more power over your life. And this ideal attitude of universal compassion and grudgelessness is only heightened within a perspective that involves trillions of years of repeated birth and death. There's no telling when any individual feud started and who was initially responsible, but it's always in your power to put an end to it. Doing so is the very essence of nobility. Therefore, in Buddhist ethics, we have a beautiful merging of consequentialist and virtue ethics. It is precisely the consequences of virtue with respect to our long-term happiness that make those virtues virtuous. By acting in virtuous ways, we cultivate a mind with habits such that it has an increasingly greater capacity for virtue in the future and, consequently, for happiness. In this way, the arbitrary divide between selfishness and altruism becomes utterly irrelevant. There will always be those people who are unconcerned with the impact their actions have on others and who are, furthermore, so committed to gratifying their capricious whims that no amount of well-reasoned moral instruction will ever reach them. Even the Tama will not get through to these people, but it does have the capacity to reach those who are intelligently pursuing their own highest happiness at any cost. Another magnificent idea I must credit Tanisaro Piku for is the recognition that the most lasting, authentic, highest happiness does not and cannot ever have any social costs whatsoever. This must be the case because a happiness that comes at the expense of others is never stable. It will be shattered as soon as the oppressed get the chance to rebel or another power seeker senses weakness and comes to take your place in the hierarchy. And even if you're ready to take what you can while the going is good, living fast and leaving a beautiful corpse, everything we previously discussed about the emptiness and dissatisfaction entailed in such a life of gratification still applies. The problem of unscrupulous hedonists, psychopaths, and egoism does not affect the tamma in even the slightest. If they're intelligent, even the completely selfish would live according to the Buddha's teachings. By doing so, they may even eventually be able to transcend that selfishness altogether. 
Now, since it was first put forward by Kant, a common criticism of any ethical theory based around the maximization of happiness is that happiness is often a very ill-defined phenomenon. This is indeed often the case, but building upon the foundation we built in chapters 1 and 2, it should be clear that the tamma is exactly the tool that is needed to resolve such an ambiguity. Happiness is understood in the tamma not as a particular ambiguous, agreeable feeling, but rather as the absence of tukha and all the mental and physical habits that are bound up with dukkha. According to the Buddha, happiness is equivalent to peace. Although the Buddha did provide some initial guidelines for us to use while starting out, it is ultimately rigorous mindfulness of dukkha and its causes that brings peace into clear focus, from a vague idea into a crystal clear, concrete, moment-to-moment reality. In leveraging dukkha as an ethical bootstrap and using the Buddha's guidance for some initial orientation, living an ethical life becomes simultaneously a very simple but also a very weighty and profound thing when you start to take peace seriously it becomes immediately apparent that peace is not even close to easy once you commit to peace of mind and contentment of heart an entire universe of mistaken myths about what is truly necessary and a lifetime or lifetimes worth of sensual habits will come crashing down on the dam you have erected to reduce the flow. When you get angry, when you have something to defend and you lash out in literal or figurative violence to protect it, that's on you. The suffering you bear for those resolutions you have regarding the world, the narratives you tell yourself about justice and your rights and what the world owes you, all the suffering that those commitments and that defensiveness cause and all the constriction in your mind that comes as a result becomes entirely your responsibility. When Dukkha is made into the ultimate arbiter, bad faith has nowhere to hide. If you're still suffering, you're living the wrong way. It is precisely because of the burden that such a direct and undeniable judiciary affords that the ethics of the Tama have depth. It's not just following a list of rules. It's a comprehensive way of life that is guided entirely by a commitment to reducing suffering and practicing self-transparency regarding all the ways you're currently falling short. And while these commitments will inevitably involve a heavy emphasis on restraint and asceticism, especially as the pursuit of eliminating suffering deepens, the path also has a whole host of preliminary positive outlets that can be incredibly uplifting and even pro-social for those not yet ready to renounce the world. This most frequently manifests in daily life as a spirit of generosity and kindness that, once you start to really cultivate and get a feel for, is incredibly emotionally freeing, even without any deeper resolution for a more comprehensive letting go. And believe me, I used to be just the kind of person who would have scoffed at such a mushy sentiment. It's only mushy until you try it and find out just how difficult a 
universalized, contextually invariant kindness can be, besides being uplifting as the wind, kindness can also be as solid as a rock. The culture of generosity, or dana as it is known in Sanskrit and Pali, is a well-known phenomenon that surrounds all religions of Indian origin, including Buddhism. Cynic as I was, I initially dismissed Tana as the obvious kind of spiritual advice you would get from homeless alms mendicants who need you to give them food in order to stay alive. The entire culture surrounding Buddhist devotional practices is an incredibly interesting topic that I am not especially qualified to comment on. But what I can say is that whatever idolatry there might be bound up in these cultural behaviors, the spirit and benefits of generosity that lie at their core are genuine and deeply valuable on a personal level. Giving to others is a direct rejection of the defensive anxiety that lies at the core of greed. It fosters a personality of openness, consideration, and ease that is such an obviously preferable way of being. And Dana does not have to be expressed solely through giving alms to monks and nuns. It can be as simple as doing a menial task that you aren't necessarily responsible for, but still needs to be done. The value of that feeling of dignified self-confidence and self-respect that comes from doing helpful things for no other reason than because you felt inspired to do so cannot be overstated. If nothing else, you are building habits of situational awareness and responsive integrity that are crucial for your own personal development and composure. When you start to tap into this new shape that the mind can inhabit, a shape of nobility, diligence, and generosity, the practice of tamma can then really start to take off. All of your old habits that interfere with the process of lightening and expanding the mind are naturally discarded over time. And paradoxically, it's a lot of the small changes that make the biggest difference. You may, for example, start refraining from making sarcastic comments, being catty with friends, or ribbing them for their mistakes. This kind of restraint is an incredibly valid and valuable expression of both sila and Tana. All the subtle ego games and conflict that those behaviors necessarily involve are recognized as simply not being worth whatever fleeting entertainment they might bring. In one sense, you will start to see such things as beneath you, but in a more fundamental way, they will start to just drop away as simply not worth the effort. Like an adult eating half a dozen candy bars like they dreamed of doing as a child, delighting in drama and the embarrassment of others will start to just make you feel sick. Candy doesn't cut it once you've got an appetite for real nutrition. This food analogy is actually a really good one because it speaks to the pervasiveness of the problem. Anyone who tries to get healthier by changing their diet can relate to the realization that eating is about a lot more than just food. There's a whole realm of emotional, cultural, and 
even economic factors at play, there is a web of reasons why there are so many obese people in America and so few in Japan. Staying thin in America or getting fat in Japan often takes effort compared to the alternative. You may have to fight your cultural conditioning, the habits that you have maintained since childhood, and go out of your way to procure different kinds of foods that aren't readily available. You might even have to go so far as getting new friends. To bring this dynamic into tighter focus, I think it will be advantageous to switch to an even more evocative example. Alcoholism. There are a variety of cultures and subcultures in the world where binge drinking is endemic. Alcoholism, or alcohol use disorder as it is now being referred to, may be genetic in the literal sense of the word, but it is without a doubt genetic in the sense that, for many, Ubiquitous drinking is something they grew up around and took for granted as just another part of life. In these cultures, all the dysfunction that alcohol causes may be recognized in a cursory sense, but it often requires removing yourself from that environment and gaining exposure to a different culture with alternative attitudes towards drinking before the more pervasive damage such a tolerance for or even expectation of drinking can have. After engaging in a brand new way of living, all the behavior you used to think of as normal or fun must be completely recontextualized. If you truly reflect and think back, you can start to recognize all the subtle ways that people's relationship with alcohol hurt themselves and the people around them, without even needing to consider the more extreme expressions of dysfunction. Yet, even after gaining exposure to a new perspective, it can still be very difficult to break old habits. When you go back home, your friends will want you to drink with them and you yourself will want to oblige them. But in the back of your mind, there will be a lingering uneasiness. You will have to make a decision. Bury it or let it blossom. Luckily, once you have really seen the danger and unhealthiness of it all, the default will actually be for the uneasiness to grow. The script has been flipped, and you can't unsee what you've seen. You can only ignore it. This is the tremendous importance of what the Buddha called right view. Right view is the first and most important pillar of what is known in Buddhism as the Noble Eightfold Path. Unsurprisingly, right view was another point of unease for me as I first explored the Tamma. Needing to believe certain things and view the world in a certain way in order to become enlightened seemed ridiculous. As we discussed in chapter 2, however, that attitude of skepticism was itself simply the result of clinging to some other unjustified and unjustifiable value structure. Metaphysics is inescapable, and the way in which metaphysics and ethics are intertwined in the Tamma is both subtle and profound. It is in the domain of Sila where the rubber of the three M's meets the road of your everyday life. When you begin to change your behavior, experimenting with new ways of living and new ways of noticing, 
those changes invariably begin to change the mental narratives that you frequent. Wisdom is inevitably developed through the process of experimentation. Though right view can begin with a set of doctrines taken on faith, it must necessarily move beyond that and mature into a fundamental reorientation of your priorities based on lessons gained intentionally through experience, ideally culminating in direct insight into the nature of suffering. For insofar as we continue to act in ways that contribute to suffering, we are necessarily ignorant of suffering's nature. If we fully understood suffering, we simply wouldn't do the things that cause it anymore. It is only because of our deluded notions about happiness that are built on the myth of sensuality that we are even capable of suffering in the first place. The Buddha used the simile of a person with a skin disease to make this point. He compared an ignorant person, entangled in craving, to someone with a skin disease who, through burning and cauterizing their wounds with hot coals, gains some small measure of relief from the itching caused by the disease. But then later, after being given a treatment of medicine that cured them of their condition, such a person would need to be dragged, kicking and screaming back to the same bed of coals that they once found relief and pleasure within. Having been cured of the disease, they now see the bed of coals for what it is, a fearful, dangerous thing that will only bring them pain and injury. For such a person, even a single smoldering coal will be viewed with wariness and apprehension. All the subtle dangers contained in that which may have previously seemed like trifling things have become apparent, and all that danger would have never been seen if the initial effort had not been made to take the medicine and become cured of the condition that warped his perception. It is in this way that ignorance of dukkha and its causes directly and necessarily entails an ignorance of goodness. If you live a life enmeshed in sensuality and craving, it will be impossible for you to fully understand and appreciate the true nature of goodness. Now, there is here a kernel of ethical authority and spiritual nobility intertwined with the tamma that can appear haughty at first glance. Any kind of discourse that suggests that knowledge of what is right and what is wrong may be inaccessible to the common man will invariably be met with hostility by the cultural descendants of the Reformation. But, as any alcoholic struggling to get sober knows, a big part of recovery involves being repeatedly humbled. Curing ourselves of craving is an incredibly difficult thing to do, and through our failures along the way, a sobering compassion will begin to arise Regardless of whatever factual wisdom we may attain in the process, compassion both for ourselves and for all our brothers and sisters in aging, illness, and death. Although one may remain restrained externally, patronizing superiority simply cannot survive the repeated internal struggle with those very same impulses that are the source of ignobility everywhere. 
a proud former leper just acquired one more disease to cure. Even without necessarily fully attaining to right view and gaining a final, comprehensive understanding of the Tama, Dukkha, the cause of Dukkha, the cessation of Dukkha, and the way leading to the cessation of Dukkha, commonly known as the Four Noble Truths, just a moderate inkling of what the Buddha was talking about can have a profound impact on the way you live and the way you see the world. We've already discussed some of the more basic ways how mindfulness of dukkha and a commitment to sila for your own benefit and the benefit of others can manifest positively in everyday actions, but when you start to maintain these habits over longer spans of time and more fully recognize their value, there will also inevitably come a kind of world weariness, almost verging on a sense of heartbreak. Having so drastically changed your level of happiness through purely internal work, the sheer magnitude of unnecessary suffering in the world that is caused entirely by repetitively ignorant decisions that are always totally, categorically, and necessarily in the hands of others becomes staggeringly apparent. Just like your dukkha is all on you, their dukkha is all on them. And you can't help people who don't want to be helped. You have started to head in another direction, and while you might call over your shoulder, the world keeps moving on its own path. In my own life, I first began to experience this new disconnect between myself and my cultural surroundings most distinctly while consuming dramatic media. With few exceptions, almost all of the drama and excitement that drives the stories humanity tells itself are derived entirely from pretty much all of the characters repeatedly making a bunch of awful life decisions. The kinds of situations that drama occurs within are the kind of situations that wise people simply never get into in the first place. And, of course, that's the point. We want to see people rising above their difficult circumstances, conquering their demons, defeating the bad guy, etc. And yet, in almost every case, the characters in question are actively perpetuating the circumstances that necessitate conflict and, eventually, heroic resolution. In the same way that those who have seen combat can never again be gung-ho for war, once you've started to pull yourself out of the flood of samsara, the kind of attitudes and behavior that keep people bound in chaos, drama, and tukha can never quite resonate or enthrall you like they used to. It becomes obvious that it is impossible to disjoin patriotism from militarism or separate romance from heartbreak. In the real world, riding into the sunset is only the start of a new drama. Nobody who plays the game of righteous vengeance ever wins. But people keep playing it and... Given how old our narratives repetitively valorizing such behavior are, they'll probably never stop. The only way to truly win is to stop playing. Committing more and more to the composure of restraint and asceticism, and thus deepening in an awareness of dukkha, will eventually lead to the recognition that the foundation of ethics is the spirit of renunciation. 
the more comprehensive and solid your composure and self-confidence grows, the more it will become apparent that the patterns and practices of normal life are not only irrelevant to your happiness, they're actually an obstacle. The burning of love is replaced with the cool tranquility of goodwill. Thoughts of social drama, political concerns, and material ambition will slowly fall away. Those things are not only mostly out of your immediate control, but they also really have nothing at all to do with real happiness in the first place. Having gone through the crucible of Samguega, the effacement of Donna, and the cooling focus of Sila, there will be a growing reserve of internal assurance and measured distance from the pole of sensuality. The need to socialize, to mutually entertain others and reinforce your own sense of social security can, at this point, be recognized as simply a distraction and limitation on the growth of inner self-adequacy, tranquility, and contentment. In order to come into a direct understanding and relationship with the true causes and conditions of happiness, it is thus necessary to walk directly against the stream of the world. Unfortunately, it is the case that the vast majority of people have absolutely no idea what it means to be truly content. And it is no wonder that they don't, because almost no one ever even tries to find out what that might mean. Even intelligence here only offers a small advantage as we can see from the large number of very intelligent people who have, in the West, been dogmatically pursuing freedom as the highest good of mankind for perhaps five consecutive centuries or more at this point, if there is no deeper guidance for how we should express our freedom, maximizing that freedom is a dead end. Without any foundation of wisdom, all the liberation that exploded out of the 1960s was inevitably going to crash and burn into the drug-addled insanity and depravity described in Hunter S. Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, or else end up spinning in the mud of the New Age bog. In our bullish rush towards pleasure and security, we never stop to question or even recognize the racket that sensuality has us in. And racket is precisely the right word to describe the situation. Craving creates the problem, and we have to do its bidding in order to get rid of it. And yet, somehow... We still think that perpetual racket is better than the insecurity and difficulty of willful restraint. The aversion to rules still remains. In philosophy, deontology is a general category for ethical theories that are based upon each individual's duty to follow a certain set of rules. While deontology is the natural system of ethics to apply within, say, a bureaucratic body, I hope to have made it clear that the Tama is not a deontological theory. It is, indeed, directly opposed to such a conception of ethics. Sila can be viewed in an immature way as simply a set of rules laid down by the Buddha to be followed unquestioningly, but, as we have already discussed in detail, it is ultimately the principle of minimizing dukkha that truly matters. 
there is actually a very specific term given by the Buddha for the deontological approach to sila, silabata paramasa. This is a term that can be translated as misapprehending and grasping at rules and rituals, and it is given as one of the very first of a list of ten fetters that keeps beings bound to samsara and prevent the realization of awakening. While holding to rituals as a form of spiritual purification is perhaps less of a problem among Western Buddhists than it was in the time of the Buddha, I certainly did my fair share of grasping at rules as I first explored the Tama. Letting go of this fetter does not mean that you stop following any rules at all. Quite the opposite. What it means is that you will have directly and intuitively grasped the kind of understanding I have attempted to convey in this chapter, the real purpose and logic behind the rules that guide the mind out of craving and chaos and into composure and peace. Though grasping at the rules should be transcended, such transcendence means that the danger of even the slightest fault has been seen clearly and will thus be avoided even more ardently. Once the misapprehension of the rules has disappeared, it will actually become even easier to follow all of them because, rather than neurotically memorizing and following a list of seemingly arbitrary injunctions, the relatively simple principle behind all the rules will be discerned. Recognizing the principle of peace, as we might call it, also grants us the ability to resolve some of the potential skeptical criticisms or creative interpretations of the rules that might otherwise undermine our faith in their fundamental wisdom. For example, we could take the deconstructive approach of questioning what exactly it means to kill something. In the Buddhist monastic code called the Fuinaya, the Buddha assigns greater or lesser severity to offenses of killing depending on what kind of creature it is that was killed. The categorization of different life forms found in the Vinaya is, naturally, incredibly primitive by modern standards. Using these taxonomic ambiguities and materialist reductionist rhetoric, we might argue that there can never be an adequate definition of what it means to kill something because everything is ultimately just atoms being reconfigured in space and thus the entire concept of murder is nonsensical. This line of argument is usually very powerful in favor of an ethical nihilism, but with the Tamma, it is totally irrelevant for directly phenomenological reasons. Killing is not defined in the Tamma in a physicalist way. The entire classical Indian taxonomy of living beings is bound up within the Buddha's broader metaphysical view of the universe, a view that is decidedly phenomenological. So, in deciding what is and is not a living being, we must turn to phenomenological tools and it just so happens that Sartre has provided us just the tool we need, his concept of the look. The look is the unmistakable feeling that you are currently being experienced as an object within the subjectivity of another. Sartre's famous example in Being and Nothingness is that of a person who is absorbed in peeping through the keyhole of a door when they hear the footsteps of another person on the landing at the end of the hall.
Without even needing to look to see the other person, the peeper is instantly filled with shame. For Sartre, this unmistakable recognition of the other through the look is the nail in the coffin for solipsism. I wouldn't necessarily go that far if only for the simple fact that I think most people could use a lot more solipsistic angst in their lives. But the case is certainly compelling. Regardless, the look is the ultimate pragmatic tool for an existential ethics surrounding actions like killing or stealing. If you pay attention you will be able to recognize the feeling of the look, even with reference to things we would very much otherwise like to consider unworthy of ethical consideration, like mosquitoes. Through its very blood-sucking behavior that we despise, a mosquito is giving you the look. It is other, so should not be killed. Plain and simple. There is a relationship established through the look, and the willful eradication of that relationship must necessarily entail some subtle expression of aversion, defensiveness, and discontent. Habits of mind that are totally counterproductive to renunciation and peace of mind. Just pay attention to how strong the look is, and you have a cut-and-dry hierarchy of ethical consideration. Rocks don't give the look. Fungus and plants may give the look, depending on how you are mentally approaching them, and so on. There could be some very rare edge cases under this system, like the potential for a person with some kind of psychiatric disorder that prohibits them from recognizing the subjectivity of others, but frankly, the Buddha's teaching isn't for other people. It's for you. It's not a political or judicial theory. It's a pragmatic and all-encompassing guide to living a noble life. And I'm willing to bet that if you have the capacity to read this book, you have the capacity to recognize the look. We could potentially explore other areas of where we might direct our skepticism, but between the peace principle and the previous example, I think the water tightness of the system has been made clear. Given how long I've been exploring this subject with a critical eye, I am personally satisfied that, on the level of the individual, the Tama completely resolves ethical nihilism, even under the most adverse of conditions like radical skepticism, selfishness, and even solipsism, a feat that I do not believe any other ethical system can claim, for even those most egotistical of ethical theories do not provide built-in means for defining, exploring, refining, and concluding the pursuit of happiness in a rigorous and thorough way. No other normative system provides the means for the end of transvaluation. Part of the Tama's solidity comes from the fact that it is not a political or social theory of ethics. It is strictly focused on the individual and the proper life choices someone should make who is intent on putting an end to suffering. Such an ethical practice cannot and will not bring about world peace. But the Tama's strength comes directly from this focus on that most fundamental ground of ethical action, the individual and their happiness. All it takes is the simple axiom of eliminating dukkha as the summum bonum of life and 
after some experimentation, experimentation you are encouraged and even required to undertake, you will inevitably find that the Buddha was not idly laying down arbitrary rules. The training rules, I tell you, are not in vain. To recognize as much may take a long time, given how strong our habits of sensuality are. Moving beyond basic sila into the realm of asceticism can feel like anything but peaceful. An excerpt from the biography of Ajahn Chah, a Thai monk who is one of the 20th century's most venerated Buddhist teachers, quotes a disciple of Ajahn Chah who put it quite succinctly. One English postulant famously exclaimed loudly in a broad northern accent, This going against the stream? It's not a babbling brook we're talking about here. It's white water. There is indeed some suffering involved on the road to the end of suffering, but this can often be mitigated by gradually building up to greater and greater degrees of renunciation, although jumping right into the white water can be a valuable learning experience for those willing to take the plunge. Whether it's immediate or a gradual, putting up barriers to our sensual impulses is not only necessary in order to begin acclimating to a less needy way of life, but the process of doing so is also mandatory for developing an understanding of all the most subtle aspects of the mind, like the difference between craving and intentionality that we mentioned in chapter one, or the shape of the mind we discussed in chapter two. Craving and the shape of the mind are not things that can be discerned directly. They are a determinative context for the constant flux of appearances within the five aggregates. Form, affective feelings, perceptions, determinations, and consciousness that can only be recognized and manipulated indirectly. Thrownness always applies to the specifically determined manifestations of craving that can and will arise on their own. Any particular instance of craving and all of our habitual patterns of perception and intention are largely outside the realm of volitional control. But it is precisely within that domain where volition does exert control that the skillful movement of the mind into a different governing context can occur, a context removed from sensuality with its attendant perceptual distortions and improper loci of attention. This must involve repetitively reminding oneself about the benefits of renunciation and contentment, about the dukkha involved in gratification and all the stupid things we are liable to do in order to attain that gratification, and then, most importantly, refraining from undermining that work by volitionally engaging in sensuality. It is impossible to attend properly to the themes of contentment and poise while you are willfully immersed in a self-constructed world that is anything but. Later Buddhist metaphysical revolutions that diminish the difference between nirvana and samsara, positing that there is only one monistic Tathagata Garbha, or Buddha nature, at the heart of all reality, such that even the act of sensuality is just another expression of, well, of Brahman, let's call it what it is, is not only self-aware in its blatant affront to the anti-monistic ontology found in the early Buddhist texts, but is also deeply 
deeply misguided on a practical level. The myth of the enlightened person fully, willfully engaged in the world, socializing, having sex, doing psychedelic drugs for spiritual purposes, while all the time retaining some kind of compassionate, non-dual lack of clinging regarding the entire ordeal, is a delusional fantasy of the highest order. Yet, it is no wonder such an image of enlightenment and all its attendant bad faith has found itself hoisted onto the proverbial billboards of Western Buddhism's corporate mindfulness seminars. As Slavoj Zizek points out, although Western Buddhism presents itself as the remedy against the stressful tension of capitalist dynamics, allowing us to uncouple and retain inner peace and Galashenheit, it actually functions as its perfect ideological supplement. Regardless of how concentrated and relaxed you are in your involvement with profane living, the fundamental principle of your existence remains dependent upon such involvement and thus fettered and imprisoned. You cannot be authentically and most effectively compassionate if you repeatedly demonstrate through your own behavior that you don't understand what goodness even is. Mindful indulgence and passionate compassion only occur within a framework of overwhelming ignorance regarding the nature and the dangers of sensuality. Sensuality is directly built out of our repeated actions to indulge in such accumulation, entanglement, and emotionality. There is sensuality, or there is peace. There is no overlap. And if you're not sure which is which, sensuality is the default. For a person trying to cure herself of her skin disease, going back to scalding herself with coals only hurts the process and forces the medicine to be reapplied before any progress can continue. No matter how ostensibly noble her motivations for going back to and immersing herself in the coals are, sensuality must be abandoned. Unimpeded craving oozes out of our lives like sores, and where the disease ends and healthy skin begins, can seem impossible to discern. Only when the flow is impeded and restrained through sila can judgment begin to be built and applied to further diagnosis and treatment. Once you've restrained the urge to indulge enough times, in enough magnitudes, and in enough contexts, the patterns of the mind can begin to be recognized. The difference between a harmless action necessarily taken to keep the body alive and comfortable for making effort towards further composure and an action willfully taken out of craving can begin to be discerned. Really homing in on this disambiguation leads to Wonderful ascetic conundrums we have the fortune to be faced with in the modern world, like what I fondly refer to as the shower temperature problem. Is it satisfying a preference? Or is it craving? It can be hard to know at first, but luckily Sila and its benefits are just as complex and robust as our biological bodies. Minor indulgences will not destroy years of ascetic discipline, and it is exactly those years of practice that will allow you to draw the line between indulgence and simply avoiding unnecessary hassle as we move around in this walking corpse. Viewing our body in just that way, 
as an oozing bag of bones that is a necessary but often inconvenient vehicle, is yet one more aspect of the context of relinquishment that Sila serves to reinforce. There is a natural progression from mundane virtue and generosity to greater forms of dispassion and letting go as the cool contentment we have built increases in strength and we gain in both the capacity and the motivation to protect and nurture that composure to even greater levels. To be unperturbed by the cares and defensiveness of an ego eternally holding on to a decomposing body is a truly divine and noble abiding in the here and now. But without the simultaneous development of wisdom, our sila will forever remain as dry as any other deontology. Therefore, having nourished our faculties with the paradoxically rich food of asceticism, we must use those sharpened faculties to investigate the roots of the problem. To understand craving and the end of craving, we must recognize, understand, and let go of that most pernicious and fundamental of sources of dukkha, our very sense of self. Chapter 4 The Suffering Self Suppose Pikus, a dog tied upon a leash, was bound to a strong post or pillar. It would just keep on running and revolving around that same post or pillar. So, too, the uninstructed worldling regards form as self, feeling as self, perception as self, determinations as self, consciousness as self. He just keeps running and revolving around form, feeling, perception, determinations, around consciousness. As he keeps on running and revolving around them, he is not freed from form, feeling, perception, determinations, not freed from consciousness. He is not freed from birth, aging, and death not freed from sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair, not freed from suffering, I say. Samyutta Nikaya 22.99 I once visited the Art Institute of Chicago and, while walking its halls, had a protracted and deeply troubling experience. As with any museum of such a high caliber, the Institute is filled with art pieces from around the world that are often hundreds, if not thousands of years old. For whatever reason, during this particular visit, the insight struck me that what I was walking through was not simply a museum of pretty pictures, but a monument built out of tiny fragments of humanity left behind by a majority of very dead individuals. Every work of art sang a song that could only briefly reference an entire lifetime that was once lived by a very real person. Everywhere I turned there was another life that had once been lived with equal complexity and texture as my own. One Renaissance painting depicted Roman chariot races. Lives within lives within lives. I felt pulled into those lives by each work yearning to know, to see, to understand who these people were, how they were able to produce such beauty and what motivated them to do so. But honestly, to me, 
their artistic capacities were almost irrelevant compared to the sheer magnitude of human emotion and sensitivity that their artwork represented. Behind each work, there was such a quantity of time, an entire world of culture and events and relationships, successes and failures, and joys and sorrows. Each life was an island unto itself, a world I would not and could not ever truly know. I wanted to be them, all of them. But the paintings were not portals to another world. I would only smack my head into oil and canvas and be escorted out. A melancholic wistfulness turned into a burning mass of spiritual frustration welling up inside me. I tried to express what happened to me to others, but there were no people readily available in my life at that time who seemed to really understand. I hope, perhaps, that the kind of person who will have made it this far into a book like this will be able to sympathize with my experience. I hope also that this book has been effective in pulling you into the Buddhist worldview, such that you will have already realized why I am sharing this anecdote. This yearning for the erasure of human boundaries and the unification of the spirit with the whole lies at the heart of mysticism and all the most common forms of spirituality everywhere. It is also, unfortunately, the root cause of suffering. This experience that I described was the most evocative example I could draw on from my own life to introduce a relatively technical concept from the Buddha's discourses, Pavwa Tangha, or craving for becoming. Tangha, craving, is classically divided up into three different types. Sensual craving, craving for becoming, and craving for annihilation. This division is really only for the purpose of analysis, just as consciousness cannot truly be recognized apart from the objects that we are conscious of, these three types of becoming cannot truly be split apart in any other way than a purely conceptual one. There is that which you want to be, that which you are pushing away from, and the enticement of sensuality that pulls you from one to another. There can never be one kind of craving without the other two. One aspect of our craving might at times be accentuated over the other two, but the whole system of becoming and sensuality always requires all three. I have already indirectly made use of this becoming concept multiple times, for becoming is an absolutely central concept in Buddhist doctrine and component in the engine of gratification. Notice, if you will, that any time you crave for something, there is always a pull to be in an embodied world where our craving can be properly satisfied. There is a pressure on our bodies as if by gravity to shift and morph ourselves into a new universe where we reside comfortably in the center of a psychic galaxy where the objects of our craving orbit close by, ready to hand. Even if the craving is dominated by a pure will to be embodied in some different, abstract identity of triumph, satisfaction, or admiration, our imaginings will still supply all the accoutrements of emotional gratification 
that come along with it, like a many-armed Hindu god grasping the rod, parasol, dagger, or censer that symbolically represents the domain of our grandeur. Or, if our craving for annihilation is at the fore, the distasteful world we currently inhabit will be vividly imagined imploding behind us in our escape to a new and more suitable world, never to bother us again. These are perhaps some relatively dramatic examples to describe a simple hankering for some ice cream, but if you care to recognize it, you may be surprised by how excessively dramatic our imaginings of even simple pleasures can be. Ignoring the romanticism of our craving is exactly how we keep engaging in it, because otherwise we would inevitably get a bit embarrassed by how over-the-top it all is, or at least have to shamelessly affirm the tackiness of our longings. This dyad of becoming fueled by the gravity of sensuality mirrors another fundamental component of craving, the bifurcation of self and world. For wherever the emotional mass and energy of becoming consolidates itself, there is precisely where you will find the sense of self, right at the center of it all. The Buddha gave a thorough treatment of all the problems that come attendant with the sense of self, emphasizing the topic as one of the most important in his entire teaching. In my preparatory philosophical research, it was in this domain of phenomenological analysis that both the tremendous insightfulness but also the limitations of Western philosophical treatments of the topic made themselves plain. With the Buddha, the existentialists also recognized the central role the sense of self has to play in the unenlightened experience of the world, with Sartre recognizing the necessity of our above bifurcation. Without the world, there is no selfness, no person. Without selfness, without person, there is no world. Strikingly Buddhist insights into the nature of the self indeed go all the way back to the very beginning of phenomenology as a field of inquiry. As Heidegger summarizes Scheller's thoughts on the subject, the person is no thing-like and substantial being. This illusoriness of the self thus described precisely mirrors the Buddhist teaching of anatta, or non-self. In the teaching traditionally regarded to be the second discourse the Buddha ever gave, the Anatalakanya Sutta, the Buddha encouraged his first disciples to dwell contemplating each of the five aggregates as unownable and uncontrollable. He reasons with them that we cannot and will never be able to dictate the unfolding of our experience, saying, let form be like this, or let perception not be like this. And thus, none of the various aspects of our experience can be ourselves or be authentically appropriated or owned by us in any way. Seeing this, a learned, noble disciple grows disillusioned with form, affective feeling, perception, determinations, and consciousness. Being disillusioned, desire fades away. When desire fades away, they're freed. Thus, phenomenology, through its approach to reality based on direct discernment first and foremost, rediscovered basic tenets of the Dhamma even in its very infancy as a branch of philosophy. 
for on the very same page as the above quote summarizing Scheller, Heidegger further recognizes the possibility for applying the phenomenological method to something as basic as intentional action, recognizing that this is tantamount to depersonalization. These quotes and the many others I have interspersed throughout the pages of this book are why existential phenomenology leapt up to a Westerner like myself as the Tama's natural hermeneutic. But I have also previously referred to the stumbling blocks of the philosophers, and this right here is precisely where they all invariably fell. This discomfort around depersonalization and the artificiality of the self is the difference between the existentialists and the Buddha. The assumption and resulting inadvertent glorification of the cogito is the philosopher's original sin, a sin that kept them bound to lives that would historically amount to little more than the production of weighty and abstruse though intellectually significant tomes. Staring into the abyss, the philosophers blinked. The Buddha did not. Consciousness doesn't come stamped with your name on it. And, for that matter, it doesn't come stamped with God's name on it either. But, despite the perpetual possibility for the recognition of the ephemerality of the self, we continue to cling to that self as if our very life depended on it. Indeed, in a way, it does. The gravity of becoming that fashions our world is also the material that we fashion our sense of self out of. Yet, the self can never be regarded directly. It is only ever the dark matter that we assume lies at the center of a massive well of craving. Search for it, and you will not find. There will always only be the Cheshire cat of throneness smiling back at you, taunting you in your efforts to find that core of safety, stability, and eternal life. Not seeing the danger in such an assumption as the core self, we take it at face value and always agree that the percipi refers to a being not subject to the laws of the appearance, but we still maintain this trans-phenomenal being is the being of the subject. This danger is the eternally futile yearning of dukkha to pin itself down and finally have itself, as Sartre evocatively describes at length. If I must suffer, I should prefer that my suffering would seize me and flow over me like a storm, but instead I must raise it into existence in my free spontaneity. I should like simultaneously to be it and to conquer it, but this enormous, opaque suffering, which should transport me out of myself, continues instead to touch me lightly with its wing, and I cannot grasp it. I find only myself, myself who moans, myself who wails, myself who in order to realize this suffering which I am must play without respite the drama of suffering. I wring my hands, I cry, in order that being in itself, their sounds, their gestures may run through the world, ridden by the suffering in itself which I cannot be. Each groan each facial expression of the man who suffers aims at sculpturing 
a statue in itself of suffering. But this statue will never exist save through others and for others. My suffering suffers from being what it is not and from not being what it is. At the point of being made one with itself, it escapes, separated from itself by nothing, by that nothingness of which it is itself the foundation. This is the suffering self. The assumption of the independent, unconditioned self at the center of the universe, though so faulty and ephemeral, is also the most fundamental metaphysical construction there is, serving as the basis for all others. Through this assumption, what is otherwise simply a field of flowing, unownable intentions, contextualized attention, and already given thusness, is warped into a throbbing flux of agitation. The self introduces us to the weight of gravity. We act as the gravitational emissary of the self, frantically rushing out to pull the world into our orbit, running back and forth to grab new fuel for the fire of craving before tossing it back into an insatiable black hole, never to be seen again. This quivering, rushing, pulling nonsense is the turning of the wheel samsara, the yearning for a completeness that is itself the condition for incompletion, the back and forth churning between one for all and all for one. The self, therefore, represents an ideal distance within the imminence of the subject in relation to himself, a way of not being his own coincidence, of escaping identity while positing it as a unity, in short, of being in a perpetually unstable equilibrium between identity as absolute cohesion without a trace of diversity and unity as a synthesis of multiplicity. Despite being the source of so much instability and effort, this self-assumption is, for most of us, simply the most natural thing in the world, hardly appearing to be such a problem as the Buddha and Sartre made it out to be. Thus, the comforting familiarity and banality of the self-world dynamic is one of the greatest obstacles towards taking on the urgent attitude of striving that the Buddha encouraged in his disciples. Gladly, let only skin, sinews, and bones remain. Let the flesh and blood waste away in my body. I will not stop trying until I have achieved what is possible by human strength, energy, and vigor. For those of us who live in a comfortable self, in a comfortable world, such an exhortation would seem a bit extreme. But in such moments, we may recall that suffering, aging, illness, and death are also pretty extreme. Sanguega is always lurking, like a comet periodically disrupting the harmonious and undisturbed movement of our solar system of self. Though rare and generally unconsidered, it is also possible for solar eclipses to occur. Our sense of self can drastically diminish or even apparently evaporate for certain periods of time, I imagine the most common and dramatic manner by which this occurs is through the use of a large enough quantity of psychedelic drugs. 
the ensuing emotional reorganization that must occur when the center of our world evaporates in front of our very eyes is no doubt the primary reason why such experiences often have a profound and lasting impact on people's lives. As mentioned earlier, intensive concentration exercises can also bring upon the same effect, often with equal amounts of spectacular mystic imagery for those with the proper disposition. This chapter will be relatively short, so we might as well take an aside here to explicitly address this issue of psychedelics, visionary experiences, and mysticism in general. I believe it is important to do so because I have found that most Buddhist teachers who are living committed to celibacy and asceticism did not themselves partake in using psychedelics earlier in life and can thus only make cautious recommendations against their use without being able to speak to the substance's limitations and dangers from personal experience. Like ex-nihilists, there are not a great number of ex-psychonauts or ex-drug addicts amongst the most senior members of the Sangha, the community of Buddhist monastics, so I feel obligated to contribute my expertise. As I stated in Chapter 3, psychedelic and or mystical experiences do not maintain any essential relationship with awakening as it was expounded by the Buddha. This is for very specific technical reasons as we have described. Awakening has everything to do with our attitude towards experience and composure in the face of the vagaries of samsara and is, therefore, not itself a positive experience as such. It is far more like a mood than a specific emotional experience. A mood that is cultivated and maintained over long periods of time to the expense of other possible moods until other moods and Indeed, any possible mood at all has become impossible. But everybody knows that there are certain experiences that encourage certain kinds of moods. And with this recognition, we can begin to understand what the Buddha was talking about when he described his teaching as the kind of action that puts an end to action. Unless you are already fully enlightened and do so by mistake, if you take 500 micrograms of LSD, your mood is going to change. The flood of images and emotions combined with the almost inevitable dissolution of the sense of self under such a large dose will literally rock your world to the core. Whatever attitude you previously held about reality will almost certainly need to change. For the average person, such a drastically alien experience cannot but have equally drastic emotional ramifications. Some of the long-term effects on a person's attitude towards life as a result of a psychedelic trip can be and often are quite positive in the conventional sense, but this is a kind of positive attitude shift that is ultimately ignorant of itself. The principle of what makes a good attitude good and a bad attitude bad is invariably still obscured. Whatever wisdom is thus gained will be only temporary not penetrating into the nature of goodness, as we have previously described and encouraged. This kind of wisdom is equivalent to all the other kinds of mundane wisdom that can be gained over a lifetime of experiences and is just as resistant to further intentional development 
and cultivation. The same goes for other visionary experiences that are produced through any manner of non-chemical means. Because the contextual shifts that occur via mysticism are most often not gained through intentional cultivation, but via grace, to make use of the Christian conception, they cannot themselves result in lasting wisdom or penetration into right view. Some aspects of the shift may be relatively long-lasting, but those shifts that were most impactful in the moment, like the erasure of the sense of self are often the same ones that have very limited duration before our long-term habits of thought and behavior take back the reins. Because they are so connected with deeply uplifting and pleasurable feelings, mystical experiences can easily be conceived as the ultimate goal of the spiritual life serving as a perennial trap for the mystically inclined. Like so many other things, even if you technically get the experience you're looking for by taking some mushrooms and communing with nature, you will not truly be gaining anything worth having in the ultimate sense. I cannot deny that the shock of such a thing could lead to the kinds of questions that demand to be answered, beginning a journey that could end up in a truly valuable place, but there are significant, undeniable dangers regarding such a beginning. The Buddha strongly discouraged the use of any substances that can lead to heedlessness, and I emphatically echo this sentiment from personal experience. True wisdom requires diligence and effort. There is no elevator to nirvana. So, beware. Beyond the danger of ecstatic heedlessness and the perpetual risk of the dreaded bad trip, it must be noted that these experiences actually never involve the total eradication of the sense of self. They only twist it into something so different as to be unrecognizable. Theistic mystics may be lifted out of themselves and merged with the divine, but in an attitude of ecstatic rapture, there is still maintained a very subtle sense of self the same pulsing sensuality that energizes all the other more mundane selves that we normally inhabit. Insofar as someone is having a very big, highly emotionally impactful experience, there is still some level of selfing involved. Just like in chapter 1, where we examined the subtle levels of stress, still remaining in heaven. In order for an experience to be moving, you must retain the capacity to be moved. You must imagine that there is an unexplored realm of human experience out there to move into, but this is a fallacy that maintains a fundamental ignorance of the nature of Dasein and is precisely the capacity that craving leverages to fabricate a problem for the imagined self, posited to be magically solvable through some hypothetical external object. No matter how abstract, spiritual, or emotionally intense the object of your mystical contemplation is, Insofar as you posit it to be a solution to your problems, you are, in reality, simply perpetuating the cycle of dissatisfaction. The attempt to grasp onto something out there that will provide the solution to the discomfort you feel in here is precisely the extent to which out there even exists. 
out there only ever exists as a metaphysical assumption motivated by and directly supportive of craving. If that statement and our previous exposition of a radically phenomenological metaphysics discomforts you, if you would accuse the tamma of solipsism as if that is some kind of argument or insult, very well. If this is solipsism, it's the kind of solipsism that, in and through, the groundlessness of transcendence and all the ungraspable fullness of immanence collapses in on itself and obliterates the divide between in here and out there, finding it impossible to discern satisfactory grounds for disambiguating the difference. Such a divide has always been strictly nonsensical. It's all just here, unless you conceive the situation to be otherwise in a fashion that can itself only ever just be here. The escape out of naive solipsism into an authentic understanding of Dasein can be undertaken in precisely the way that Heidegger already thoroughly described for us all. However, such an escape is practically and existentially incomplete until we have recognized the link between sensuality and the self. Through gratifying in sensuality, we reinforce our habit of conceiving our problems to be out there and in that vacuum of emotional space caused by the external lack, the self instantly emerges in here, ready to be fed. In this way, out there and in here are actually the exact same misconception, the magnetic dipole of the self-world. It is this habit of sensuality and its fuel, our fundamentally ignorant misconceiving with respect to the nature of reality, that constitutes the difference between craving and intentionality mentioned in previous chapters. Craving always entails a self at the center of a world. Intentionality does not have to. It is possible to regard the functions of intentionality in a purely depersonalized way, in the way that was a bit unnerving to Heidegger. Doing so requires that a context of asceticism and composure that constrains the expansive tendency of the self-world to be upheld and intensified, while simultaneously working to undermine the sensual view of the world through purposefully and continually contemplating that universal ontological equivalence of all phenomena, their perpetual, ubiquitous, unownable thrownness. Even an aspect of experience so frequently sucked into the field of the self-world as volition itself can and should be recognized in its thrownness. For where does volition even come from? Where does the capacity for volition come from? Why did it come about? And how does it even function? You can give all the physicalist, neuroscientific justifications you want, but those thoughts are only ever something you're volitionally engaged in. Volition precedes its own explanation. And we can only ever retroactively justify our experience as having been set into motion by a volitional act via the capacity for memory which is yet another positively magical thing that 
obtains no satisfactory explanation. All explanations of such phenomena can only assume themselves to be satisfactory out of ignorance regarding the explanation's ontological dependence upon precisely that which it seeks to explain. There will never be an adequate explanation for Dasein. It and its constitutive elements can only be recognized and understood as such. Thus, free will can never be adequately explained, nor can consciousness. Such philosophical inquiries as the hard problem of consciousness or the existence and precise metaphysical qualities of free will are, in this way, fundamentally misguided from the very start. Volition is discerned. Consciousness is discerned. And that's it. Yes, they exist as such, and no, they cannot be any further explained. Any further attempt to explain these things will always necessarily be entirely bound up within the ontological framework that such fundamental aspects of Dasein always already constitute. Any metaphysical grounding or causal justification for the manifest reality of these phenomena can only ever be entirely speculative. Speculative in a way that is almost certainly going to be ontologically backwards. The Buddha compared people asking him for answers and explanations for such metaphysical topics to a man who is shot with a poisoned arrow who will not allow the arrow to be removed until he knows the name and the clan of the person who shot him the type of wood that the bow was made out of, the kind of feather the arrow was fletched with, and so on. The desire for some more hypothetically substantial explanations only emerges out of the gratuitous assumption of a being not subject to the laws of the appearance, a being that can somehow acquire more information about reality than reality itself already supplies. This yearning to get out of our own skin is precisely the assumption of the self-world, a very dangerous assumption to make. The self's attempts to ground itself in the world and to have itself are doomed from the very start at the most fundamental ontological level. The ground of nothingness perpetually surges up into the perceived fullness of the bright sky of being, only ever to close its fingers around empty air. But then, in its falling back down, nothingness discovers of itself that it actually is not ground, for in its falling, it falls down right back into being, once again founding itself through being as its own nothingness. We are dealing here with a being which annihilates itself in its being and which seeks in vain to dissolve into itself as a self. Neither the solid imminence of being nor the energetic transcendence of nothingness can escape this groundless interdependence and mutual insufficiency, and, as such, neither the world nor the mind's concerned contextualization of that world can ever hope to lay claim to the hypothetical independence and sufficiency of the true self. The only reason we fear the earthquakes of skepticism and nihilism 
undermining the ideological scaffolding we build our lives upon is because we're still attempting to live up there doing somersaults in the sky rather than down on the real ground. That true place of rest and coolness is always right here. It just takes honesty and effort to uncover the ontological mistake that is the self in all its ridiculous questions and unsatisfiable yearnings must be polished and smoothed out and effaced and understood and endured until it finally fades away and disappears. There is frankly little else that needs to be said on the topic of the self. That deeply perturbing reality that our very sense of self is not something that we can ever truly lay our hands on to claim or to own would be motivation and contemplative direction enough for the person who takes such a thing with adequate seriousness and existential integrity. Most confusions regarding the apparent inscrutability of the Buddhist teaching of anatta just stem from any number of egregious, culturally conditioned metaphysical assumptions combined with generalized philosophical, specifically phenomenological illiteracy, bad faith, a pig-headed commitment to sensuality, or, most commonly, some combination of all four. The basic introduction I have laid out here covers most of what is practically important or necessary to understand regarding the self, and beyond that, the phenomenologists already did all the heavy lifting for us, between themselves writing hundreds of dense pages on this topic, all dripping with meaning and discernment. Their analyses were comprehensive and thorough with only the most crucial exception of not recognizing the equivalence that the self-world maintains with the assumption of sensuality and thus the genesis of dukkha. By transmitting his teachings to us via oral tradition, the Putta could not provide for us quite the philosophical comprehensiveness or detail that the philosophers did, but that was never his intent in the first place. Practically speaking, the self-world only needs to be understood to the extent that such understanding facilitates its abandonment, which is precisely the facet upon which the Buddha homed in on and expounded with incredible levels of discernment, as well as almost oppressive oratory force and repetition. If I had the inclination, I might take a decade or so to quibble over all the little conceptual differences the philosophers maintain with each other and with the puta on the topic, but they essentially sing in harmony. If you need the words of some very intelligent Germans or Frenchmen to lend ear to the ancient Indian voices in the chorus, I believe I have made the case sufficiently. Even with all their words in mind, putting an end to nihilism and eventually to dukkha in its entirety is something each of us must do on our own by repeatedly undermining the sensual self assumption, the assumption that ignores the suffering in gratification and the insecurity inherent in belief. Beyond pointing in the right direction, there is nothing that I or anyone else can do to resolve the problem that is your life. After a certain point, reading books like this, getting instructions from a guru, and even just frequently socializing and being around other people will actually become deleterious. Beyond being a distraction, living in the constant company of others 
we'll repeatedly invoke old social habits and assumptions that reinforce sensuality and the self-world distinction. Upon eradicating the delusion permanently, there is no further necessity for isolation or, for that matter, any necessity for anything at all, but prior to that point, living entangled in both the pressure and the gratification of the look will create constant roadblocks to the process of self-effacement. For most, our social circle and that which defines it, the gratification and identification we derive from it, serve as the most essential aspect of our self-world's gravitational dynamics. Company is, in the end, simply another shroud for us to conceal from ourselves the groundless thrownness and meaningless meaningfulness that constitute our lives. As such, Making truly effective use of the information in this and other books is, ultimately, something you must do alone. The self-world is a prison, but there is freedom to be found in a secluded dwelling, a wilderness, the shade of a tree, a mountain, a glen, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a forest grove, the open air, a heap of straw. If you dare, go and find it. Mendicants. It's totally impossible that a mendicant who enjoys company and groups, who loves them and likes to enjoy them, should take pleasure in being alone in seclusion. Without taking pleasure in being alone in seclusion, it's impossible to learn the patterns of the mind. Without learning the patterns of the mind, it's impossible to fulfill right view. Without fulfilling right view, it's impossible to fulfill right composure. Without fulfilling right composure, it's impossible to give up the fetters. Without giving up the fetters, it's impossible to realize extinguishment. There's no way that one delighting in company can touch even momentary release. Heeding the solar kinsman's words, wander alone like a rhinoceros. Transcending the contortion of views, the sure way attained, the path gained, realizing, unled by others, I have knowledge arisen, wander alone like a rhinoceros, with no greed, no deceit, no thirst, no hypocrisy, delusion and blemishes, blown away, with no inclinations for all the world, every world, wander alone like a rhinoceros. Chapter 5 Buddhist Ruins Go to me, the qualities of which you may know. These qualities lead to passion, not to dispassion, to being fettered, not to being unfettered, to accumulating, not to shedding, to self-aggrandizement, not to modesty, to discontent, not to contentment to entanglement, not to seclusion, to laziness, not to aroused persistence, to being burdensome, not to being unburdensome. You may categorically hold, this is not the Tama, this is not the Vinaya, this is not the teacher's instruction. Anguttara Nikaya 8.53 A useful litmus test I have discovered, similar to the one given by the Buddha himself in the immediately preceding epigraph, for determining whether a particular teaching or practice, 
Western or otherwise, has anything at all to do with what the Buddha taught is to simply look for whether or not the values of renunciation, celibacy, austerity, seclusion, or sense restraint are discussed even a single time. I believe such a discriminatory tool can be so useful to the prospective disciple of the Buddha that we might dub it with an official title, the Dhamma Domestication Detector. If you take such a tool into most Western retreat centers or almost any sufficiently large and well-funded Buddhist temple or monastery in Asia, you will invariably hear all the alarm bells blaring at full blast. As Piku Sujato, a prolific translator of the Pali Canon and preeminent scholar of early Buddhism, put it when referring to that most populous stronghold of the Theravada Buddhist sect, there's a lot of Buddhism in Thailand, but not a lot of Tama. Such a phenomenon is not recent. It only took 500 years after the death of the Buddha for the Tama to be thoroughly domesticated. Everywhere it has traveled, Buddhism has undergone the same process again and again of being slowly declawed and integrated into the surrounding culture, continually corrupted from within and without until some particular form of expression attained harmony with its surroundings and then simply faithfully replicated itself generation after generation for hundreds of years. Every form that has successfully replicated in this manner has necessarily been a significant departure from the originary ideal of solitary monks striving for awakening alone in the forest. Time and time again, the city monks start to outnumber the forest monks until solitary practice becomes rare and scholasticism becomes the dominant form until that too is partially abandoned for ritualized devotional practices, astrology, and traditional medicine. The Buddha inevitably becomes a franchise. But is this really any wonder? The radical lifestyle ideal described in the earliest Buddhist texts could never have mass appeal. For Buddhism to become a religion at all, it was necessarily going to need to be adapted to the needs of the many. The many who have little, if any, urge or inclination to resolve the fundamental problems of existence in any final or lasting way. The average historical Chinese rice farmer was far more interested in being protected from spirits and being provided with an auspicious day for planting his crop than anything the authentic Buddha may have had to offer him. Though the Buddha explicitly forbade many of them, such practices and many other superstitions were inevitably going to penetrate into the Buddha's dispensation. I do not want to portray these kinds of cultural expressions as fake Buddhism. In fact, domesticated Buddhism has been the dominant form that Buddhism has taken throughout its history. The problem is that this particular popular religious form is, at a practical existential level, almost indistinguishable from any other. There is much to be said about the kind of large-scale cultural and political impacts that different religions can have on the populations that live under their sway. I do not mean to equate any religion with any other on this macro level. There are indeed significant differences between the Christian, Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist worlds that stem directly from the popular religious beliefs that are held sacred by each of those civilizational projects. What I mean to say is that, for the average person, 
changing from one set of religious beliefs to another is likely not going to have a significant impact on his or her lifestyle. There are lazy, unvirtuous Muslims and lazy, unvirtuous Buddhists, as well as very devout, altruistic Muslims and devout, altruistic Buddhists. No religion has a monopoly on mundane goodness. But mundane goodness is not what we're interested in here. No popular religious form is going to encourage and facilitate the kind of burning existential angst and anxiety and subsequent radical internal transformation that is necessary to address and resolve nihilism and dukkha in the here and now. Nor, might I remind the reader, do secular forms offer us any greater hope. The contemporary project of secular Buddhism has invariably been just one more example of the Buddhist domestication process at work. And that's fine as far as it goes. It has simply proved insufficient for my purposes and, I think, for anyone whose purpose is to truly go beyond common happiness. If you want to better cope with life in a crazy world, then, yeah, you can do some yoga followed by a bit of loving-kindness meditation. Those things will make you more calm for a little while, but if we're being honest with ourselves... A Xanax or a heavy strain of indica would probably be a lot more effective. Again, I'm not encouraging drug use, but the point needs to be made that anything less than a total rejection of sensuality is not ultimately going to amount to anything more than coping with our existential condition as opposed to totally overcoming it. In addition to the great wandering on, samsara could also accurately be translated as the big cope. I would, frankly, prefer not to even have to write this chapter. I am indebted to secular Buddhism for providing me a palatable inroad to the Tama, though through such a journey I later rejected it. I have also come to a deep appreciation of a wide variety of Asian cultures through my study of Buddhism. There is a great deal of conventional happiness, peace of mind, and dignity of character to be found in traditional Buddhist practices. I have seen the positive impact they have on people with my own eyes, an impact that does not require them to shave their heads, become celibate, and contemplate their impending death alone in the woods all day. I do not want to engage in the polemics of calling all of my own religions, cherished traditions, a bunch of uneducated, decadent, fundamentalist coping mechanisms that are distortions of the Buddha's teaching, distortions that could have been easily recognized as such if anyone had even bothered to actually read their own scriptures with a critical eye, rather than waiting for Westerners like Bhikkhu Sujato and Bhikkhu Analayo to come and dedicate their lives to doing the kind of rigorous scholarship and analysis that should have been done a hundred years ago. But I digress. I would like to not have to write this chapter but because I have only very recently had to go through the laborious process of penetrating into the Buddhist ruins myself, a process of education and research that is perpetually ongoing, I sympathize with the position that I leave any of those whom all my previous words have successfully converted into being Buddha-curious. It is the case that through simply living according to the gradual training and committing to the process of mindfulness, integrity, self-scrutiny, and effacement that has already been described and can be further explored in the suttas, the sufficiently desperate and ardent person could completely eradicate suffering or at least come quite close to doing so. Such a person would, at the very least, certainly overcome nihilism within no more than a few years at most. 
my case has already been made, and any further need for justification likely only comes from a place of terror at the prospect of sitting alone by yourself with nothing to do but be with your own mind for months on end. Such a terror is quite normal. I understand that the sufficiently evangelized reader will no doubt want to do a bit more research before committing any significant portion of their life to celibacy of both a physical and psychological variety. To that end, I wanted to write this chapter to address some of the most common trends of tama domestication that I have identified commonly operating trans-historically and trans-geographically. This will inevitably involve either implicitly or explicitly criticizing most of what Buddhism is and has been, East and West, ancient and contemporary. I will endeavor to keep the criticism primarily implicit, both out of politeness and out of the recognition that this problem isn't a particular problem of a particular culture. There's no one to blame for this process because it keeps happening everywhere. This is human nature at work. And for most, a domesticated tama is exactly the form that meets their personal needs. Domesticated does not need to be a pejorative, though I understand this has not so far been the impression. Domestication provides stability and broad access, conditions that can serve as a breeding ground for the countervailing force of renunciation. There is a less powerful, less common, but equally pervasive recurring trend within Buddhism of small groups of monastics who retreat from the large monasteries with royal endowments back to the mountains and the forests to attempt to realize the truth of the Buddhist teaching for themselves. Alan Robert Lopez has identified Chan-slash-Zen Buddhism and the Thai forest tradition as the two most famous examples of such homegrown Asian Buddhist revivalist movements. It is my hope that the continuing research of early Buddhist studies will provide the resources for such movements to recur with even greater frequency in any time and in any place across the world well into the future. The early texts and the lifestyle they promote are simply incompatible with domestication of any kind, so cannot ever be divorced from their core existential value, which I have attempted to elucidate. It is precisely the degradation of existential immediacy and the urgency of some guega that constitutes domestication as a serious problem. If there is any force that has been more historically effective at theologically neutralizing the urge towards taking radical measures to resolve the problem of being, it is the perennial gravitational pull exerted on the tama by Brahmanism. Vedic Brahmanism can very clearly be seen throughout the Pali Canon as the dominant Indian cultural milieu that the Buddha's teaching was necessarily in response to. The practices and beliefs of the Brahmins were frequently held up to criticism in the Pali scriptures, but it is not any specific ritualism described in the Vedas that concern us here. What concerns us is rather the metaphysical entity called Brahman that more fully developed in the early Upanishads and continues to serve as the foundational metaphysical construct within Hinduism to this day. Brahmanical monism has, unfortunately, been an idea that has consistently and usually successfully penetrated into the framing and interpretation of Buddhist ideas and practices. Whether it is interpreted in a monistic or pantheistic way, holding oneself to be an emanation of the divine ground of reality is one of the oldest most subtle 
and deeply pernicious of spiritual conceits, a conceit that most famously slithered its way back into Buddhism through the Mahayana Buddha nature doctrine previously mentioned in chapter 3. Perennial philosophy is another instantiation of this idea in which Aldous Huxley attempted to reconcile all the monistic tendencies found in the reported experiences of mystics around the world into a singular perennial truth, describing that truth as the metaphysic that recognizes a divine reality substantial to the world of things and lives and minds, the psychology that finds in the soul something similar to, or even identical to, divine reality, the ethic that places man's final end in the knowledge of the imminent and transcendent ground of all being, the thing is immemorial and universal. Rudiments of the perennial philosophy may be found among the traditional lore of primitive peoples in every region of the world, and in its fully developed forms, it has a place in every one of the higher religions. Though it may often be shrouded in the appearance of unity, humility, and universal compassion, the idea of all existence being ontologically unified under and equivalent to some kind of singular divine ground is problematic on a variety of fronts. The first is that Insofar as such a claim is not utterly trivial, it is actually quite nihilistic. Scientific materialism could easily be held up as a prime example of a perennial philosophy, but somehow people don't seem to feel so comforted considering themselves equivalent to a soup of subatomic particles as they do in thinking themselves as an emanation of the Godhead. The only difference here between nihilistic physicalism and Brahmanical monism is a romantic twinkling of the eye, a simple difference in emotional interpretation of the phrase, we're all stardust. The ethical nihilism contained in such a view is epitomized in Krishna's instruction in the Bhagavad Gita to the reluctant Arjuna urging Arjuna to go to war and fight, though many will die, for it is the duty of a warrior to fight and kill as their manifestation of the eternal and fundamental pattern. The nonsense of monism and perennialist romanticism lies in the fact that even if Arjuna chose not to fight, that decision would also still ultimately be an emanation of Brahman. The mystical vision I have regarding my place in the universe one day may be completely different from another such vision I have next week, which forces me to totally reformulate my sense of telos within the universal whole with which I identify. And that process of ethical churning can and will go on indefinitely, potentially obtaining no consistency whatsoever. Just throwing your hands up in the air and saying, all my cultural conditioning tells me that I am a certain thing and so I have a duty to act in certain ways and I currently emotionally feel like that sense of duty is also valid at a cosmological level is not actually saying anything ethically meaningful at all. Holding that all the seers and sages of world history have been communing with the same world soul, touching different parts of the same elephant such that they all have their own particular limited access to the same fundamental truth, is functionally equivalent to nihilism. At best, it is a facile substitute for organized religion, utterly beholden to the whims of the emotions and the charisma of the mystic. It is my suspicion a suspicion that I imagine 20th century political activist and member of the untouchable cast B.R.M. Bedkar would fervently agree with, 
that following one's dharmic life purpose as an emanation of Brahman most often simply serves as a metaphysical tool to justify resigning oneself to enact the social role that one is born into with as little critical reflection or existential discomfort as possible. To domesticate oneself. Ambedkar spent his life fighting against the macro-level impacts such an attitude has on Hindu society, and it is obviously also utterly crippling to the self-critical inquiry so essential to the Buddhist path. Beyond substantiating the perpetuation of oppressive social structures, as well as personal heedlessness and existential apathy, Monism further destroys the division between the sacred and profane and necessitates the monist to follow Leibniz into the highly dubious assertion that, being ultimately equivalent to the divine principle, we must be living in the best of all possible worlds. I suppose by now it goes without saying that indefinitely going along with Brahman's meaningless, macabre charade and tying oneself to a world where suffering abounds is, perhaps, in our opinion, not the wisest of decisions. In his definitive work on the most recently monistically tainted development of Buddhism, he calls Buddhist Romanticism, Tanisaro Piku writes, By fostering an imminent rather than transcendent solution to suffering, Buddhist Romanticism encourages people to stay within the web of interdependencies that are causing them to suffer, to accept the vagaries of an interdependent, interconnected world, and to define their desire for well-being totally within those vagaries. We have already explored how the sense of self and suffering are joined at the hip, and this exposes another fault of monistic religious doctrines. If they are not nihilistic, trivial, or mechanisms in service of bad faith, metaphysical monisms encourage a subtle level of conceit. They are theories of self and inevitably form at least a subtle source of craving and suffering. Even when held within the heart of an otherwise deeply humble and ascetic individual, thoughts effectively equivalent to I am God can only spell trouble. It is only a matter of severity whether that trouble remains entirely within the mind of the sage or spills out into the actions that others might take on their guru's behalf. This leads us to the most common corollary and practical expression of Brahmanism's world-friendly trajectory and influence, which is what I will here refer to as the altruism trap. I will admit that I have always had a relatively heartless disposition, one does not become a nihilist through an overabundance of empathy. But I do not want to be mistaken here. Altruism, giving, and compassion are always good things. They're good things to do and to be even for otherwise selfish people, as discussed in Chapter 3. The open-hearted kindness, generosity, and forgiving nature promoted and cultivated within cultures of dana is perhaps the greatest strength of Hinduism, Sikhism, and conventional Buddhism. For those intent on simply living a basically good life, dana combined with a baseline level of sila is, without a doubt, the supreme vehicle for realizing such an aspiration. But, in the pursuit of an even higher good, in pursuit of the resolution of nihilism, existential anxiety, and suffering itself, altruism must be approached from a correspondingly higher perspective. 
just as the concrete material damage we do to others through our unskillful actions is paltry in comparison to the long-term ramifications such actions have on our future states of mind and behavior, the mundane good that we may do for others out of charity and goodwill has a highly limited and often uncertain scope. We cannot ultimately know how our generosity will impact the world, how significant or long-lasting the benefits will be, or, indeed, if our good intentions will be beneficial at all. Even if we experience that ultimate misfortune of bringing the world a little closer to hell through our good intentions, the positive impact those good intentions had on our own mind was precisely that which was never in doubt. Within all the uncertainty and limitations on our attempts to benefit the external world, it is important to recognize that the impact our actions have on our own mind and our own suffering is always that one aspect that is both completely within our control and utterly predictable. Not recognizing this is essentially what constitutes the altruism trap. Through perpetually trying to help and save a world that in its very structure and nature does not want to be helped or saved, we can end up wasting a lot of time cleaning up a house that is just going to get dirty again, while simultaneously soiling ourselves. Though the foolish are factually in the most need of help, they are also the population of people least capable of benefiting from whatever aid they may receive. To criticize a metaphor that I once heard a Vajrayana Buddhist teacher employ, thinking oneself a peacock capable of digesting the poison of the world without being harmed and indeed using such poison only to sprout beautiful plumage is a deeply naive idealization. This ignores the immediate dynamics of our social environment and our complicity in sullying ourselves in it. Our environments inevitably do have a direct and immediate impact on our behavior, thoughts, and attitudes. Wisdom is not to be found in the company of fools, and the reality of helping other people is often far more akin to feeding a wild, snapping animal than anything else, because that's precisely the bestial state of nature that constitutes tangha. The kinds of things people do with lottery money and the common disastrous fates such winners usually eventually end up bringing upon themselves is all the evidence you might need that most people are hopeless cases regardless of their particular material conditions. And heaven help you trying to teach such people about contentment. In defining one of the pillars of the Noble Eightfold Path, right action, the Buddha focused entirely on not doing certain things rather than prescribing certain actions. And what, monks, is right action? Abstaining from taking life, abstaining from stealing, abstaining from sexual intercourse. This, monks, is called right action. In abstaining from actions that harm ourselves and others, we are actually still acting in an altruistic way, giving others the gift of protection from the harm that we might otherwise do them now and on into the future, while giving ourselves the highest gift possible, the gift of virtue, composure, and contentment. In terms of effective altruism, ascetic restraint and the ensuing eradication of the very roots of suffering does far more long-term good than perpetually putting band-aids on the downstream results of those root causes. I believe that this is probably the gist of what Ajahn Chah meant when he said, 
abandoning the unwholesome. It's more important than doing good. Doing conventional good can only ever have conventionally good results. And, in the end, the suffering of others is a philosophically murky realm of conjecture that inevitably has far more to do with our own feelings about that projected suffering than anything else. The only absolutely certain suffering in the world is that which is felt right here. And luckily, that most indubitable suffering is also that which we have the most direct and impactful control over. So, by all means, be altruistic, but remain vigilant that you are not using your notions of external responsibility to avoid doing that uncomfortable work awaiting you within your own mind. Metaphysical doctrines of equivalence between the self and world, which must manifest phenomenologically in the dukkha of the self-world, and an emphasis on doing every good imaginable in the world besides that most difficult task of finally uprooting the world, have been some of the oldest and deepest expressions of domesticated tamma throughout time and space. The only forms even more common are the myriad ways that the triple gem, the buddha, the tamma, and the sangha, has been made into a fetish, an idol to be worshipped as a form of ritual purification and magical protection. But at that point, we're just talking about a universal aspect of human religious behavior writ large. Whether or not the triple gem is involved is only incidental. All these ideas, habits, and attitudes have been developed and maintained for millennia and will no doubt continue to hold sway in the minds of adherents and enthusiasts of Eastern spirituality around the world into the indefinite future. And I will continue to be at pains to emphasize that that is all very well and good if that's what you're after. But don't mistake it for practicing the Tamma. What are not so well and good are some of the newer additions to the Buddhist ruins that solely serve to distort and confuse without offering anything of remedial value in return. Materialist justifications and interpretations of the Tama are perhaps the most obvious offenders here in the world of Buddhist modernism. So let me be very, very clear. The Tama has absolutely nothing to do with neuroscience. The ontological assumptions and ultimate goals of neuroscience and positive psychology are completely at odds with the world-renouncing conception of happiness put forward by the Buddha. Wisdom is not something that can ever be quantified or understood through a microscope. Attempting to pin down eudaimonia through brain scans or Psychometric indices will never resolve the very suffering and craving that motivates that scientific enterprise to begin with. Looking for some kind of therapeutic intervention or literal happy pill to solve dukkha is the epitome of bad faith. Your problems are not out there in your brain. But people don't want to hear that. They'll run around to the ends of the earth, searching for the perfect study to put before a peer review panel so they can sleep soundly in the security that a bunch of other oozing mammals rubber-stamped their idea of happiness before they'll allow themselves to actually witness their own mind and the terrifying, lonely vulnerability of their existential situation. Physicalist medical hermeneutics can also have a 
devastating impact on Buddhist training when combined with the myriad meditative concentration exercises, positive emotion cultivations, and insight techniques on offer in today's burgeoning meditation marketplace. We have already once mentioned Mirlo Panti's criticism of the notion of sensation as a pure, inscrutable, dot-like impression. Mirlo Panti really comes out of the gate swinging at this idea from the very first sentence of his Phenomenology of Perception, writing that we utterly misapprehend perception when we treat it as an incommunicable impression, because such impressions always come bundled with a richness of gestalt, context, and communicable meaning. I reiterate Marlou Ponty's criticism here because I very much agree with the focus and intensity of his attack, for it is an attack that is directly applicable to the conceptual framing of a great many meditation exercises being taught out in the wild. There are some people that believe that the purpose of meditation is to catch every fleeting sensation in their body as if they were some kind of human oscilloscope, perceiving the pure electromagnetic fluctuations in their nervous system with millisecond precision. Such people are utterly deluded and have entirely misapprehended the reality of their own experience. There is no such thing as a pure, isolated vibration of experience with a precise beginning, middle, and end. To conceive experience as such means that you are necessarily ignoring the mind, the existential realm of context, intuition, understanding, and authentic temporality as described by Heidegger, as well as the transcendent nothingness of Sartre. In doing so, you will have thus entirely closed yourself off from any understanding of Dasein as it actually is. Read the suttas, read the phenomenologists, and don't fall into this trap. As for the topic of meditation in general, I would simply advise caution and resolute skepticism. In A Critique of Western Buddhism, Glenn Wallace thoroughly points out all the ways that meditation is currently being co-opted to serve as Zizek's perfect ideological supplement to late-stage capitalism. To summarize his critique of this particular issue, putting the point very bluntly, if a set of meditative tools and techniques are being embraced by Google and the World Economic Forum, that should be an indication that there is probably nothing of any contemplative value in them at all. Living a conscientious life that gradually builds an unshakable foundation of sila while moving towards minimizing trivial engagements, conflicts, and distractions in favor of broad wholesomeness, generosity, simplicity, reflection, and ease is going to do a lot more for you than 20 minutes of breath meditation a day. Consider instead simply spending those 20 minutes thinking about how to cultivate a greater level of contentment and generosity in your life and attempting to recollect any lapses in virtue, strategizing and resolving towards not repeating them, or simply basking in the composure that your unbroken virtue has built for you. To further undermine ubiquitous assumptions about Buddhist meditation, it may surprise the reader to learn that Many Buddhist traditions lifted their corpus of meditation techniques directly out of the Upanishads, 
the yoga sutras, and qigong exercise traditions. The situation is perhaps the worst in the ostensibly conservative Theravada Buddhist sect. As Gzegish Polak points out in Re-Examining Jhana, the Theravada meditation tradition had all but completely died out prior to the 19th century and was only revived through referencing dubious, millennia-old meditation manuals like the Visuddhimagga and combining the techniques found within with still extant yogic concentration exercises. If you look at the earliest texts, instructions to concentrate on a single point in the body or to even really concentrate anywhere in particular at all are completely absent. Rather than taking the form of intensive yogic concentration resulting in deep states of almost total sensory deprivation beyond the singular object of focus, early Buddhist meditation usually seems to be described in a form much closer to the more European conception of meditation that the word originally connoted, contemplation and reflection, but with a layer of classic Buddhist mindfulness at the bottom. And this does have some sense to it, just like you wouldn't be able to learn about how an engine works by simply staring at one of its pistons for hours on end, you will not come to an understanding of the mind by repeatedly, mindlessly attending to a particular physical sensation. You will come to an understanding of the mind by, surprise, surprise, trying to understand it. Beyond the Theravada, the meditation traditions found in Vajrayana Buddhism as well as Chan slash Zen are older, more diverse, and more open about their extra-Buddhist influences. Zen techniques in particular are, in their sometimes inscrutable simplicity and emphasis on broad, open awareness, perhaps most aligned with what the Buddha may have had in mind out of all the traditional Asian lineages, Chan is, after all, the oldest and most vibrant continuous Buddhist meditation tradition in the world. Of course, we will never as a collective definitively know anything for certain about what the historical Buddha did or did not teach, though scholars like Karen Arbel, Alexander Wynne, Tillman Vetter, and the other early Buddhist scholars previously mentioned have all contributed to deepening our understanding of early Buddhist meditation. Given the atmosphere of ongoing research and debate that permeates this topic, it would be foolish to express an early Buddhist fundamentalist viewpoint here, for there truly is no such absolutely coherent or unassailable perspective. Through exposing the history of Buddhist meditation, I only wish to promote an attitude of free inquiry, open-mindedness, and healthy skepticism regarding the topic of meditation. If you disagree with my dismissal of yogic praxis and would really like to explore some fixed attention, single-pointed concentration exercises, that is your prerogative. I can only reiterate that the dimension of the mind is not going to be found in the shimmering flux of your breath. It will be found in the always simultaneously present phenomenological context and constitutive ontological basis for the very capacity to be conscious of the body in the first place. Regardless, Tanisaro Bhikkhu has called the Tama holographic, in that each individual element of the teaching contains within it a compressed view of the whole. I am confident that anyone who successfully works her way 
through the first six or seven steps of the gradual training would be able, with enough self-transparency, self-questioning, intensive research, and rigorous experimentation, to finish the jigsaw puzzle on her own without needing the Buddha himself to hold her hand. So, meditation has been co-opted by capitalism to suit its own needs, and Buddhist meditation is itself of complex origins, but these are really only background issues. The main issue with meditation is the common tendency that I already mentioned in chapter 3, that it is often taken to be the totality of Buddhist practice, with everything else being preparatory or supplemental. This attitude is perhaps the most subtle and ingenious version of tama domestication that has ever been devised. In being transformed into a daily routine of mental exercises, the tama is neutered into a form of mental hygiene like a toothbrush for the mind. But, as with physical health, the ignored reality here is that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and, to extend the oral analogy, it's much more important to stop drinking the sugary beverages that are rotting your teeth at the roots than perpetually working on perfecting your brushing form. It is a travesty and a scandal that the absolutely central topic of sensuality and its dangers is so totally ignored in so much of popular Buddhist discourse. I roar my lion's roar and take a categorical stand on this point. There is no authentically Buddhist meditation outside of the abandonment of sensuality. Breathing your way to enlightenment only works when every other part of your lifestyle is supportive of composure and letting go. Effacement is not a technique. It's a commitment. If nihilism and dukkha are things you are truly interested in overcoming, the temptation to turn the Buddha into an empty aphorism printed on a magnet slapped on the corner of the refrigerator door that is your life must be refused. Question all assumptions that lead to complacency or dependency, both within and without. It is imperative that you allow the wilderness of existential angst and personal responsibility to penetrate the pasture of your life to whatever extent your chosen lifestyle will support. Do not let yourself be fully domesticated by samsara, for a bovine existence only ends in the slaughterhouse. But remember that you can only rage against the machine of the world by obliterating your very capacity for rage. In so doing, you will, through effort, inevitably come to a confirmed confidence in the Tama, knowing for yourself that this is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Conclusion Nihilism Resolved Now then, monks, I exhort you. All fabrications are subject to ending and decay. Reach consummation through heedfulness. That was the Tathagata's last statement. Diga Nikaya 16 Nihilism is, in its essence, the most abstracted 
and universalized manifestation of libidinal frustration. Like sexuality, the desire for higher meaning and purpose is born out of a desire to, in a sense, be granted a second life. This life and all the meaning that is manifest within it is ignored as we search for a second metaphysically parallel existence that will somehow be more true and more justified. The meaning we experience in this life is somehow not enough. We yearn for that meaning to be itself made meaningful by another layer of meaning that is imagined to, in some way not ever fully articulated, grant this thus given existence a fuller depth of justification. The baseline insufficiency of life is betrayed in every mental impulse towards making it into something more than it is. And nihilism, though it recognizes the absurdity of any multi-level meaning structure, still languishes in bemoaning the manifest lack of deeper telos. Like all other manifestations of sexual frustration, if it were not such a serious and fundamental problem, one might describe the spiritual insecurity of nihilism as rather cringe. In fact, feeling into the cringe that is characteristic of the emotions of embarrassment and shame can be a highly instructive contemplation. Specifically, consider the actions and attitudes that lead to cringy behavior. In every embarrassing thing we have ever done, there is always, either directly in the action itself or the self-conscious attitude we might layer on top of the situation in question, some aspect of insufficiency and insecurity. The sun, the sky, a mountain or the ocean are, in their horrific immensity and implacable indifference, immune to embarrassment. Our slimy human sensuality and passion in all their myriad forms, from hatred, defensiveness, and aversion to lust, social neediness, and greed, always lie at the heart of our shame. In this recognition, we may find common ground with Nietzsche as he exhorts us towards surpassing our shamefulness. What is the ape to man? A laughingstock, a thing of shame. And just the same shall man be to the ubermensch, a laughingstock, a thing of shame. In casting sensuality aside, it is only an arahant, a fully awakened being that has put behind her shame and has joined those forces of nature in becoming something more, or perhaps something less. Such an overcoming cannot be done on a whim. Letting go is unfortunately a process just as unownable as the rest of our lives, though it is several degrees more controllable. And it will run counter to almost every psychic habit that we have previously accumulated for an indeterminate amount of time. Practicing the Tama can at times feel incredibly Kafka-esque. Deciphering and implementing the instructions of ancient texts of unverifiable validity that were the product of organic, repetitive oral transmission, modification, and expansion in order to somehow resolve a problem that you don't even fully understand and yet has the most immediate and pressing relationship with your perpetually treacherous and stressful 
existential situation is not a project for the faint of heart. If you do not feel threatened and ripped apart by the letting go process, if the pressure of restraint and endurance and doubt and some vega does not bring you to tears multiple times, then you're probably not doing it right. Everything you think you are and everything you hold dear needs to go, and the process of abandonment will very probably take years. It is only an eagle-eyed commitment to the truth, an uncompromising lion-heartedness, the burning fire of some vega, and a totalized disenchantment with all other possible modes of life that will provide the necessary strength and motivation to keep trudging forward through the muck of your own mind. There is no other way. There is no escape from this. The cost of knowledge beyond the corrosion of doubt. The cost of transcendental nobility. And the cost of salvation from Dukkha is, quite simply, everything you have. But such a price, in comparison to the alternative, is not all that bad. There is a tremendous amount of sustained, all-encompassing happiness that awaits in the cool waters of composure and contentment. Once you have tied the wild animal that is your mind to the post of discipline and mindfulness, the pangs of craving will eventually, inevitably, begin to subside. Just resting in the knowledge that enduring the pressure of restraint is pretty much 90% of the work can be incredibly liberating in and of itself and, dare I suggest it, kind of fun. Like a toddler flailing and contorting his body all over the floor in a tantrum, watching the mind twist itself into every and any possible outlet and justification for gratification can actually be incredibly entertaining when taken with a good bit of humor. Like a good parent disciplining that toddler, all you really need to do is have some patience and wait for the little scamp to tire himself out before he will inevitably come to accept your boundaries and begin to behave within the constraints of decency and good sense. After a while, the secluded, unburdened lifestyle of an arahant will simply become your preferred way to live. The scalding, burning passion of sex, drugs, and rock and roll will eventually stop holding any appeal at all. Indeed, the thought of returning to such things will start to make you feel just a bit nauseous. The karma of this lifestyle of restraint is what the Buddha called the karma that leads to the end of karma. I think it's relatively obvious to everyone that, in general, and for a wide variety of intersecting reasons, more good things happen to people who are disciplined, hardworking, considerate, kind, and generous. At the very least, such people avoid all the additional misery that befalls the stupidity of acting in ways oppositional to virtue. In a mundane sense, this is pretty much the total extent to which an understanding of karma needs to be taken. But going deeper into a life of renunciation, we can begin to discern directly what it means to be putting an end to karma. By engaging in sensuality, we build and contribute to an ongoing narrative that is directed and colored 
by our habitual intentions and perceptions of identity. The more subtle, the more aloof and composed those intentions and identities become, the more translucent, airy, and simple the narrative grows. Narrative requires character and drama, but if you just throw out the script and tell all the actors to just sit quietly on the stage, the show necessarily starts to fall apart. There will be hecklers in the audience that will boo and throw things and pressure you to restart the show, but eventually they'll get bored and leave the theater, abandoning you to finally have some peace and quiet. A subtle identity built around the peaceful lightness of a mind well tamed will emerge in the heckler's place, but so long as even the subtlest forms of sensuality are rejected, that considerate audience member will eventually leave as well. The fire of sensuality requires the energy you willfully give it through your ontological appropriation of the world in order to keep burning. And once all the energy is starved out through mindfulness, restraint, and authentic understanding, the theater will fade to black for the last time. This is freedom from freedom. And what the Buddha referred to as the cessation of the world. Reverend, I say it's not possible to know or see or reach the end of the world by traveling to a place where there's no being born, growing old, dying, passing away, or being reborn. But I also say there's no making an end of suffering without reaching the end of the world. For it is in this fathom-long carcass, with its perception and mind, that I describe the world, its origin, its cessation, and the practice that leads to its cessation. With unflinching commitment to the truth, and properly directed effort, the knowledge gained through both the practical and intellectual study of the Tama will eventually begin to metabolize into wisdom. Wisdom will, and by its nature, must affect an image ground reversal. The inquiry is turned on itself, and the bounds of the problem are finally delimited when you go to the ends of the world you will be met with a stunning accusatory silence the silence the void at the heart of existence will not yield to criticism or scrutiny it will gently embarrass you for having ever expected to find anything of value anywhere else. For those other avenues would, could, only ever lead back to the silence. This truth is discerned. In the silence, there is the end of transvaluation and there is only a single question it will answer. Approaching, humbled, one may ask, How do I stop suffering? The silence will respond. Sit down and let me kill you. This is not a mystical vision. This is not 
an incomprehensible, indescribable feeling. In the heart of the Buddhist ruins, there is simply nothing less than the most profound exegesis of the human condition that has ever been expressed. I owe everything that I have written in this book to a precious treasure that I found in the most unexpected of places. I never would have expected to write a book like this. I did everything I possibly could to not write this book. I pounded away at every nook and cranny, pursued every avenue of criticism and doubt I could think of to discredit these teachings, to expose the Buddha as a fraud and a fool. But the only fool that was ever exposed through that entire process was myself. I didn't want to do any of this, but what I needed to do was to be sure. I needed to be sure that there was no other way. Certainty and security are not things that you will ever find anywhere in the world. But those questions for which there are no final answers are also those questions that do not ultimately need answering. I exhort you, keep throwing out everything that is irrelevant and uncertain until an answer bursts forth from your own heart, covering heaven and earth. Time is short. The tools are there, available to be put to use. Or are you still willing to resign yourself to life as you assume it must be? Are you willing to gamble your life on the meek, cowering, pathetic position on nihilism and suffering taken by Robert Rosen as he writes? The truth is that instead of solving all his problems and thereby incurring the disaster of a final solution, man must reconcile himself to a perpetual process of approximations of prudential adjustments and accommodations, sometimes in the direction of daring, sometimes in the direction of caution. Is that really all your life is worth to you? An accommodation? The days and nights fly past. Death is coming. Stare long enough into the void, and you may find yourself prepared to meet it. Epilogue. Further resources. For those who resonate with the approach to Tama presented in this book, an approach we may call existential Buddhism, I can recommend no teacher more highly than Achan Nyanamoli Taro. A very large collection of Achan Nyanamoli's Tama talks are posted on the YouTube channel Hillside Hermitage, with new talks being added on a consistent basis. Together with the community that he leads, Achan Nyanamoli has expounded in both his talks and writings a radical, penetrating, and comprehensive guide to living the holy life that leads beyond merely coping. 
For a more mainstream early Buddhist Theravada perspective than Venerable Nyanamoli, in the English language there is perhaps no more accessible, prolific, and eminent figure than Tanisaro Piku. Pra Ajahn Jeff has published dozens of books and essays on every facet of the Tama, from absolute beginner introductions to in-depth philosophical essays, all available absolutely free on the Tama Talks website. Ajahn Jeff has also recorded and uploaded hundreds of audio Tama Talks, with more added all the time. If there is any particular aspect of the Tama you would like to research and learn more about, Ajahn Jeff has almost certainly given a talk about it and probably has also written multiple essays and published an anthology of discourses from the Pali Canon that address the very topic you are interested in, all translated himself. I highly recommend reading his Pali discourse anthologies as a means of immersing yourself into a broader familiarity with the suttas. Ajahn Chef is also perhaps the foremost Western expert on the Vinaya, the Buddhist monastic code. Tanisaro Piku is a titan of Tama in the English-speaking world. Piku Sujato is no less prolific than Tanisaro Piku, though is more focused on translation, and early Buddhist research than teaching. Sutta Central is an invaluable resource where Venerable Sujato has made available for free an English translation of almost every, if not every, single discourse in the Sutta Pitaka, the basket of discourses of the Pali Canon. Venerable Nyanavira Tara was an English Piku who was ordained in Sri Lanka in 1950. Venerable Nyanavira's Notes on Tama is probably the first and certainly the most influential text ever written on an existential, phenomenological approach to interpreting the Tama. However, Notes on Tama is also very technical and requires at least some working understanding of a wide variety of important Pali terms. Without such a background, or at least some immediate access to a Pali dictionary and a good scholastic work ethic, notes on Tama will likely remain totally inscrutable. Be well, and never give up.